Melchizedek Truth Principles From the Ancient Mystical White Brotherhood By Frater Akkad Spiritual Name of Rev. George Graham Price Chapter 1, Pathway of the Soul A soul had walked the earthly path. His mission he fulfilled. And dropped the earthly coil and left it at his will. Among the souls beyond the veil. He found himself there numbered. For he had not experienced death. He passed but through a slumber. And as he wakened, quick to see. He found his mission he had not filled. He sought among the teachers old and said. What is the perfect will? An ancient sage then to him replied. What choice was yours, while in the flesh you did abide? Was it to serve in fullness there? The God you left to go to earth? Did you spread love? Did you reach forth, your fellow man to lift? How come you thought your mission filled, your body then you left? You shall return again to claim another earthly shell. Your work not done has just begun. Fear not to then return. For you have wisdom gathered, son. And much of man have learned. Go forth and seek another shell. And there in love you shall dwell. And tell the tidings of great joy, of God, of love. And thus employ all righteousness, and not ill will. And should your body temple reveal to man of earth a frailty perchance. It is but for the reason, son, desire has so ordained to be. And not of God but your decree. Go forth in power and seek to find the selfless ones, the lame the blind. The lame who faltered along life's road. The blind who would not see. The deaf who would not hear the story told. Move gently, son, with humble heart, slow of step, falter not. Reach forth your hand and should man fail to grasp it as you stretch it forth. Then let it fall with gentle will. At your side but press on still. Press on O Son of God, and falter not. For man shall learn man shall see. And you O Son of God, because of your return to earth, shall teach your fellow man that birth is not of soul it is but flesh. The soul moves on in endless quest. Until at last when light has come. Because of you, God's eternal Son, man shall remove his every blot. Then you can say, my work is done. You shall but say your work is done. But never shall it be my son. For you as we, shall find a soul, who walks the earthly way. Whose will it is to speak of God. And you shall go his way. You shall touch his eyes, he shall see the light. You shall speak as in his ear, and he shall hear. As you shall speak, for you shall say. No fear O man of earth, no fear. God is your counsel, be bold. Go forth and speak of love. I too I too have thus so told. Think not O son of God, your work be ever done. For man of earth needs light and truth. And God needs noble sons. No more the physical sorrow bear. But you shall toil with man of earth. Your work is never done. Peace be with you dear ones. And as we have previously mentioned, there are those who are in constant attendance with you, ever seeking to fulfill their mission. Their work is never done. You shall tread life's path cautiously. What mean I in so speaking? Not with fear, but never expect to be fully understood by mortal man who walks in darkness because of his rebellion unto God. It is the one who walks in darkness who needs you. It is the one who because of disobedience, wears a broken body, who needs you. It is the one who would be hungry who would thirst, the one who has lost his way along the path, who needs you. The physician comes but to he who is ill of body. The teacher comes to the one who is desirous to learn. And never forget, whatever. Knowledge you possess through your desire to serve God becomes wisdom and wisdom is priceless. It is the foolish man who says in his heart, I have all the wisdom there is. I know. He or she who so states is the one who shall stumble over their own declaration. We say to you, perfection with few exceptions, has been reached only by a few. The more your knowledge becomes wisdom, the greater your illumination. Dear hearts, you shall always find a place wherein you may share your wisdom. 
your wisdom shall never go wanting. If it were not necessary for you to have wisdom, it would be because God's work on the physical plane has become finished. As long as man continues to make mistakes, as long as man continues his disobedience to God, and that is the greater mistake, as long as man forgets from whence his all of. Everything has come, man needs guidance. You have encountered many so afflicted. Do not become dismayed, for when you tenanted your previous physical habiliment, you left it by the wayside, because you felt your work was finished. Why did you feel your work was finished? Because you felt self-sufficient. But as you return to be numbered among, and I say return from the place from whence you came, to be numbered with the celestial hosts, you found that you had left unfinished business. The sage of old said to you, Son daughter, go find another earthly shell. See yonder. There is a man and women. They are now preparing a physical vehicle for you. God and claim it. Your spiritual mother and your spiritual father so bid you do. And as you claim the body they are preparing for you, you shall learn to call them mother and father, but do not forget your spiritual parentage. For were it not for your spiritual parentage you would not be. Go back to earth. Move among you fellow men. Tell them the story of light, life, tell them the story of love, the greatest power of God. Love. Tell them that strife among men never brings conquest. Tell them the story of love, and in love there is no selfish conquest. Tell them son and daughter, return to earth and tell them for their physical time is wasting. It wastes because they are wasting it. Knock, upon the door of their hearts, while there is yet time for them to hear, lest they too leave an unfinished pattern. Here you are numbered among your fellow men. You have always been with them. You do not recognize them? It is not strange. Why do you not recognize them? For the reason that when you moved with them before, they were clothed in another garment. Do not be confused man of earth endures no trail but what he has earned. Man meets no man of earth, but whom he has met before, and whom he shall meet again and again and again, until his portion of life's pattern is finished. Do not worry. Do not fret, dear hearts. You shall find a place to rest your cross. And it shall not be on an ignominious hill of Golgotha. You shall place it in the fullness of God's eternal light. Where is your cross? Where do you carry it? What shape and likeness? It is but the physical body. That is your cross. Behold your shadow, or shall I make it definite for you? The shadow of your earthly temple. Stretch forth your arms and what do you find? The shadow of the cross. God's light casts no shadow, God's light swallows up the shadow, dear hearts. How? In this wise, God's light dispels all physical chaos, all physical strife. God's light cleanses and purifies man's thinking and there is no shadow in God's light. As you stretch your physical hands forth and see the shadow, of the cross formed by your outstretched arms, your physical body, you shall say, O cross of flesh, you no longer crucify me. I am the resurrection and the life. I am God's child. You deceive me no more. O oh, physical cross! I no longer hang upon you. I am free. You, O oh, physical cross are now subservient to me. An heir. Long you too shall be dissolved. Unto the elements from whence you came, I have risen. Truly the Father and I are one. I have experienced Gethsemane. I have experienced life over death. I live. Dear hearts, now you speak those words to your physical cross, you are the resurrection. You are the life. Why do you become disturbed? Why do you become overwrought? Why do you become a part of those who do not understand? You can never help man in his darkness by becoming part of his limit understanding. How shall you help him? Indeed you are to help him. You help him in greatest measure by not becoming a part of his chaos, than by those sympathy, becoming submissive to it. For mind you well the master of masters never expressed sympathy. Compassion, love was the watchword of the Galilean. Never sympathy. 
Sympathy is but a physical attribute and born out and I am going to be rather frank born out of inquisitiveness of the five physical senses. We leave this truth with you. Love brings about the perfect analysis of life. Compassion heals. Every seeming obstacle which gives this appearance to you as you walk along the physical path, is but a reflection of past experiences. And as you learn, dear hearts, as you learn through love to lift, you not only lift another, but you lift yourself. You spiritually can never become confused, now mind you that well. You spiritually can never become debased. You spiritually never know weariness. What becomes weary? What becomes debased? Ah dear hearts, man's moral thinking, therein lies confusion. You are spirit now, as you have always been, as you always shall always be. And the reason you're wearing the present physical body is because you are here on unfinished business. And how are you to remain unencumbered from the chaos, created by those who are lesser understanding than yourself? Well in the wise. Let your divine intelligence which is your perfect mind, which is God mind, spiritualize you intellect. An intellect is but mortal, you know, and it is the composite of the desire created by the five physical senses. It is that which must become spiritualized. It is that which must become cleansed and purged. When intelligence has immersed, has anointed, has baptized the intellect, then dear hearts then shall come to pass the statement of the Nazarene when he said come let us reason together. For remember, there is a serpent of wisdom, that is the all-knowing intelligence of God. And there is a serpent of deception that is born out of the weakness of the intellect. The serpent of wisdom shall devour the serpent of deception. For it is the serpent of deception that grovels upon its belly in the dust. But not the serpent of wisdom. We love you, we love you, we love you dear hearts, with an everlasting undying love and in this hour we have endeavored to leave with you a lesson for your fellow man, wherever you may meet them. Do not be given over unto appearances, for in so doing you shall become swallowed up with emotion. Emotion is not spiritual, dear hearts. It savors nothing of the serpent of wisdom. Come down, dear hearts, come down from the cross of flesh, come down. Stand in God's light where there are no shadows. Listen to truth, not the physical intellect, you listen, and the serpent of wisdom, shall devour the serpent of deception, and as you listen, you say I will live, look not for signs. Look not for symbols. Walk forth and into your physical body breathe the breath of life with an understanding dear hearts. And none of you become over anxious, for over anxiousness is a frailty of emotion and it causes man to run foremost and headlong, so to speak, causing him to trip over his own feet and fall. It will put him quite often on the limb that he is sawing of. Continue to speak truth to the physical cross, for remember it is a tree. It shall bud. It shall leaf forth. It shall blossom. How? With strength. It shall no longer persecute and crucify you. It shall serve you as you so intended it to serve you, as the earthly vehicle which shall carry you among man of earth. Through it you shall serve your God, speaking the message of love. Chapter 2, There is no death. Greetings, there is no death. There is part of the sun in the apple. Part of the moon in the rose. Part of the flaming Pleiades. In everything that grows. Out of the vast comes nearness. For the God of love of which man sings. Has put a little bit of his heaven. Into every living thing. Life holds no mystery. From the very beginning, as man of today understands the beginning, life has been complete. There is nothing that man can add to life, but there is much for man to enjoy. Life offers every happiness, peace of mind, health of body. Man should be enjoying these if he but understood, the underlying principle of life. What is it? It is simple. It is but harmony. Man shall learn to live in harmony with himself first. What can man offer to his fellow man other than that which he possesses? What else can man share? Only that which he possesses. Man shall learn to live in harmony when he learns the meaning of love. Each teacher in his time, unto his own people, in his own language, 
has taught the one and only principle of harmony love. What shall man gain by being at enmity with himself? Your most recent teacher has said love thy neighbor as thyself. Likewise has he stated, Inasmuch as ye have granted unto the least of these my brethren, ye have granted unto me. The eternal principle of life say to man, Unto thee I grant, all power is given unto man in heaven and in earth. Where is heaven? It has been referred to by the psalmist of old as the secret place of the Most High. The master mystic whom man has accepted as Jesus the Christ, said the heaven of the Almighty is with you and he made the statement in this wise, Know ye not that the kingdom of God is within you? God is always in his heaven, and the only heaven man shall ever know anything about is the kingdom of God, in consciousness. Let man not live in enmity with his neighbor because of erroneous teachings. We are happy to visit with you. We are not strangers among you. Many of our counsel are in attendance with you, and it shall ever be so. Counsel refers to this, refers to are the sages and teacher of ancient mystical white brotherhood, though unseen to human eye, they are still active, aiding humanity in spiritual service to the eternal cosmos known to us as God. Since all life take it first step from the first cause, the positive and negative of divine essence, or as some would say the male and female principle of infinite cosmic divine energy. The first step into form of light. This is often referred to in metaphysical allegory as the sun or the metaphysical child. This sun or light of divine spirit builds the embryo in the womb of the mother. After completely the physical form with its five physical centers, it then builds the seven spiritual centers in the etheric body. The last or seventh center is in the uppermost part of the brain, the pineal gland. When that is completed the body is brought forth away from the protective covering of the womb within the mother asterisk. You are never alone. There is no death. Man as his creator, is birthless, ageless, deathless. A sage of ancient age said this, weep not for me. Let not they days be days of mourning. There is no death. Look. See. From the horizon's edge comes my ship to bear me home. It has passed this way before. Upon this ship we have sailed together to reach these shores. Weep not for me. Let not thy days be days of mourning. Death is but sleep. See in western sky the living glow of the setting sun. Day shall break and it shall rise again. Man shall wake to see its beauty. How long we have been together. We shall meet again. Listen. In thine inner being thou shalt hear the voice in clarion call say to thee, I live. There is no death. Thou shalt tarry for a while, then thou shalt follow on and in the vastness we shall meet and each shall wait. Desire shall rend asunder the encasement, which thought, has created to hold man fast, and upon the rising of the sun, Man shall choose a woman, and there he shall find nestled in her womb, beneath the heart of love a body and as the sun rises in the heavens high. He shall bring forth. Each one in his season, so shalt live. Turn not thy days into days of mourning, but as thou wouldst stand at the portal of thy dwelling to greet one who had gone forth, but to return, so greet the messenger of sleep. Struggle not with that which expresses the infinite love of the infinite God. What man or women of earth shall lie their body on the couch of rest and say, Tomorrow I shall see you, my dear? Shall he fear that sleep which erases all claim to evil? Worry not. Live in peace, strive not against thy fellow man. Become not entrapped with the viciousness or error. Hold not against thy fellow man, love. Of he who encounters that which man has learned to call strife, hardship, poverty, pain, sorrow. It is but as the handwriting on the wall, which the great seer Daniel was called to interpret. Accept it as a lesson. Look within thine own heart and ask, what have I done to have brought this to my dwelling place? The master teacher of you age has likewise said, resist not evil. Moreover, overcome evil with good who is the man who shall say, that is too hard for me to do. I cannot forgive. I cannot give good for evil such a one is standing in his own light. Out of all the strife of yesteryear, the kingdom of God now expresses. How come this to be? How come this experience? 
along the life path of any man, all has not been evil. Good eventually submerges evil into the eternal abyss of its nothingness. You are familiar with the parable of the story of the prodigal son desire took him from the father's house. Desire for experience directed his attention in another avenue. Much evil seemingly befell him. But at last the good of which he had been apart from the beginning, and was never separated from, asserted its birthright in the father. And you will remember he said I shall return to my father's house for there is plenty there. Look not upon the seeming mistake of yesteryear. Discard it. In truth it has never been a part of you. Be there an unpleasantness among you, become mindful of some of your fellow men who are now enjoying the blessings which you have created, from the heart of love. Remember never forget. When you have spoken a kindly word, when you have clasped a hand with the warmth of spiritual friendship, and in so doing, have lifted fell load from a weary, troubled heart, and, perchance, have never again made physical contact with that individual will you from this moment forth, rest in the assurance and the blessed infinite insurance that somewhere along life's path you have dried a tear. You have soothed an aching heart. You have stilled a throbbing breast, wrapped in the throes of anguish. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for having been an instrument though which God has been able to express. In humility remember and soon, I assure you, soon that which may appear to be of a problem to you this very moment, shall melt as the ice of your earth place melts in the presence of vibratory action of the sun's rays. Forget whatever unpleasantness has crossed your path. Call it not back to memory. Let it bury itself in its own dust of its own nothingness. Likewise as the master of masters said, if thou be smitten upon one cheek, turn the other. Love knows no pain. Love knows no sorrow. Love knows no regrets. Regret not one experience through which you have passed. For each experience along life's path is a new lesson, and each lesson well learned is putting new wine into new bottles. It is no disgrace for man of earth to become drunken upon the wine of life. Remember. Never forget. Man cannot sprinkle the perfume of kindness on another without a few drops falling upon himself. We welcome you. Your work has just begun. We are aware there is an interest among you because of the which man of earth, has learned to call a troublesome season. Be not overly wrought, neither concerned with that which man has learned to call adversity. Each one of you here present shall wake to the morning, when that which gives the appearance of a problem shall have vanished into the nothingness of the night. And the sun of the new day shall swallow it up. Here again the sun or light is used. It was later revealed that the were speaking of the understanding of divine wisdom and its application in a new day or a new age that would dissolve many of man's problems and the confusion they present in the political, economic and social order. Lay not your head on pillows of worry. Let us assure you that harmony shall prevail. Love shall make itself known. Misunderstandings shall find themselves as the prodigal son on the way back to the father's house. There are various forms of that which man has learned to call death, death to one ideals, aspirations, inspirations. Death to that which man has learned to call the future. Remember dear hearts. Never forget it. Man makes many plans. God's is the perfect idea. You are a reflection of that perfect idea. When you have learned to cease making plans and particularly planning of life, as it were, of another individual, there shall be no inharmony. Expect nothing from your fellow man, other than that which you would freely, loving give. Let plans cease to be. Place yourself, through your thinking in the heart of the perfect idea, and if, in due season you shall find that you have become a stranger to the perfect ideas, it is because of the confusion which you have permitted to permeate your thought process. What am I trying to tell you? When it appears to be the most difficult to love, express love in as great a measure as you can. When it appears to be the most difficult for you to talk with your God, talk with your God. Pray without ceasing. How shall man pray without ceasing? Shall he separate himself at certain intervals or periods from his daily occupation or daily routine to pray? I dare say not. Let your every thought be in the attitude of prayer. In this wise shall ye speak in thought. This which I am doing, 
I do as unto you the Father. Should there be a seeming misunderstanding, let your thought to the one from whom that appearance of misunderstanding seems to come, be in this wise. Dear heart we are one. There is no separation in eternal principle. There is no division in God. We have been one from the beginning. We are one now and shall so ever be. You will say to me perhaps. And your questioning shall be within reason. Should you say to me perchance, the one who I am holding in the allness or the oneness, perhaps they decide that it shall be different I repeat. Never forget this. There is no separation spiritually. It cannot be. Love knows no separation. Listen. Time is not. Distance cannot be. Memory holds its cherished reflections. Love is eternal destiny. I trust we have brought you a small portion of leaven with which to leaven your loaf of life. May you continue to enjoy the beauty and the love of God as you, through your understanding and the rendering of service unto your God, have brought you a goodly portion into manifestation. Each one of you are traveling on the highway of spiritual success. Let nothing deceive you. Be not confused and forsake not that which you have espoused. Remember the words of the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, when he said, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the time shall be, that thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. Let us assure you, dear hearts, that you are in the youth of your spiritual growth. With all the knowledge you have acquired, you are yet babes. The road is long, it is bright, and be there a sunset. Of ignorance, you shall never see it set. It has been a privilege a privilege pleasure to have visited with you. May your loaf belle avend. I leave you with these words. You have cast your bread upon the waters of life. They are returning to you. After many days you are finding them. Blessed are you of the Father's house. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I should have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am ye may also be. Inasmuch as I go, I shall return again quickly. Mansions of experience, the universe the house. In your quest you are beholding the Christ, for he has returned to your quickly. He has beheld your star, heard your call and answered your summons. Your Christ has arisen in the kingdom of heaven in your consciousness, dear hearts. So mote it be. Bless you. Bless you. Chapter 3 the auric vehicle and astral shell. Greetings. All is well. From within the heart of the eternal cosmos, we bring a benediction of love and we accept the great love you so graciously share with your fellow men and shall it ever be a divine benediction to your soul's consciousness. Unto the God of the universe that which is God's and unto Caesar's that which though their desire is rightfully theirs. It never becomes necessary for one to speak in condemnation toward another who has violated the immutable law of nature, for he himself has pronounced his own judgment. It becomes not necessary in the least wise for man to become concerned with the undoing of another. For he who is of the household of Caesar cannot be turned from his path of destiny, as he so chooses to follow, until his own undoing proves to him that he follows after phantoms of the night, as it were. And unto he who has cast his lot with the divine source of all goodness, man can add to him no greater blessing than that which he invokes upon himself by his goodness and kindness. To know the riches of heaven is to be at peace with God, and to be at peace with God, is to behold naught but goodness in all creation. Man is the noblest handiwork of God and regardless of the path he may choose to follow, that path which leads to the lowest degree of degradation, behold in him the goodness of God which he in his choice has refused to behold. Such is the law of righteousness. To those of us who are disembodied, there is no evil. For in your books of books, it is written, God's eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. We are happy to recognize you and accept you as willing channels through which to pour forth the nectar of life. You will find that the yoke of righteousness never becomes burdensome and the path never becomes rough nor dark. There are no chill valleys though which to pass and no insurmountable heights. This you have already experienced in the path you have so chosen to follow. There is no penalty imposed upon man by God. God is just. 
Man's love for his fellow man is proof sufficient. Man's dislike for man, which man has learned to call hatred is sufficient unto the keeping of the day, but that is the only judgment man shall ever know. Love begets love. Hatred begets hatred. The magnet of love attracts the spiritual riches of the Father's kingdom. Hatred and contempt become a repelling force. When man shall come to understand that he rules his kingdom as he so chooses to do, he shall no longer call life a problem. There is nothing problematic about life, other than man so creates it to be. Man should have long since accepted this as truth, had it not been for the fact that he has been erroneously taught. There is but one path. We prefer to call it the path of fair play. That is rather a commonplace term, but it is our preference. Set not in judgment of another. May I repeat please? Set not in judgment of another. Let man live freely, to give freely, to accept freely, is but another link in the golden chain of eternity. Wait not for the coming of eternity after you have left your physical coil. Be ever mindful, dear hearts, that eternity has been from the beginning, for the beginning is eternal. There are certain individuals here upon your mundane sphere of life who labor under the untruth that much of their misbehavior is due to the fact of mischievous impish, disembodied entities and that is untrue. It cannot be. It is contrary to the law of life. Come. Let us reason together. As man so chooses to live the pattern of life allotted to him in each physical experience, so he builds about him that which we desire to call an astral shell. May I pause for a moment and give expression to this next thought? What happens when y'all yay your body upon its couch of rest? Where are you? What takes place? The Apostle Paul put it in this wise, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And may I add, man creates this astral body or shell as it were. How? By every act, thought, word and deed. Have you ever had the experience of watching a chick pick its way forth from the shell? Quite often it becomes necessary to aid the tiny creature. Why? Because of the overabundance of calcium in the shell. It make it rather difficult for the baby chick to gain its release. What does man do? Every unkind thought, expressed in every unkind word, the result of which becomes an unkind deed, builds, as it were an overabundance may I use that term please, of calcium in his astral body. Who releases man from this astral shell? No one but man himself. Now what happens when you lay your body on its couch to rest? You move into this astral shell. It is the means of conveyance, as it were, which carries you to the astral plane of life. But where are you? You are in the spiritual body which the Apostle Paul referred to. That which the sensitive or psychic, or mediumistic individual sees is not the spirit. It is but the spiritual body which takes on or bears. The semblance of spirit. Now then if it were possible for disembodied entities to torture, tempt, or torment man of earth, to cause man of earth to act unbecomingly, how could this be brought about, if it were possible? But it is not. Would there not have to be some manner of attraction in the mental process of the individual who was enduring the torment, the tempting, as is accredited to the disobedient, disincarnate entity? Let us reason further, please. Why would those on our side of life be interested in choosing willing agreeable susceptible channels, such as you dear people, to voice the message of love, life and immortality, and become unmindful of mischievous, destructive entities here around about us? This is not conducive to common sense logic is it? My next statement is not in the least wise in derogatory mention to the numerous teachers who have written books, upon books, upon books, on that which man has learned to call obsession. May I ask you this question? When does spirit become spirit? Only after it has left its flesh habiliment? Reason tell us no. Is that right? Spirit has been spirit from that which. Man has learned to call the beginning. Is that correct? Now then, may we reason a little further. What difference is there between you who listen to me and me, who tenants temporarily, this physical body? You are spirit now, are you not? Is that not true? Student, 
Yes. Do you become spirit to any greater or lesser degree after you are released from the physical body? Student, no, but you are oriented differently. Very well spoken, my good brother. Why then does not man become equally as oriented while in the flesh? Now we are becoming better acquainted with that which man has learned to call precepts of truth. I will grant you freely and wholeheartedly that there is an obsession and it comes about in this wise, man directs his attention toward the obsession from those who are released from the mortal coil and becomes wholly unmindful of the true source of center of obsession, which comes from those who are yet in the flesh embodiment. That is your source or seat of obsession. Student, you mean a living person could obsess another living person? Without any question whatsoever my friend. Student, so long as they are both functioning on the same level of consciousness. Again wisdom express itself. But when in consciousness, man has arisen as it were, above the sordid mundane attraction, he is no longer susceptible to the thought process of those in the flesh, who are bent, as it were, in the direction of causing discomfort. How does this discomfort come about? You are all acquainted with the auric vehicle, are you not? When you come in contact with one who is radiating love, peace, harmony, what is your feeling? It is kindred, is it not? And quite often you say or express yourself in this wise, I cannot wait until I meet them again. How is this brought about? By the blending of the aura. When there is yet a fragment of distrust, when the old vehicle, as it were, is not thoroughly cleansed, there is a possibility, or may I say a likelihood of attracting that which is projected through the aura of one who is of the baser nature. Is this understandable? Student, I am not a saint. I have made a lot of mistakes. Yes that is true. We grant that. But your greater desire is for the greater spiritual manifestation is it not? Student, I made mistakes in the past. I don't want to make many more. Let us not speak of the past, and I do not make that utterance in the measure of chastising. God forbid. Now since you have mentioned it, let us again reason about the past. Never look backward my dear friends, never regardless of what the experience may have been. Never look backward. Never become a lot's wife. Never even have the slightest desire to look backward. Never over the shoulder. Remember not even a tiny peak, if I might use that expression. Forward. Onward is always upward. It cannot be otherwise. May I repeat that statement? Forward, onward is ever upward. Student, may I ask a another question? Yes, indeed. Student, we have reason to believe that at times, in our sleep, we are attending a school, as it were but we are unable to bring back a clear concept of our experiences. Now what can we do to perfect this memory concept in our consciousness so that we are fully aware of it and are able to bring it back with us? What is the next step? May I endeavor to help you? You are justified in acknowledging the fact that you do attend a school, in what you term the sleep state. You desire is to remember what takes place during that period. Is that what I am to understand? Student, to bring back the memory, yes etch it in our objective brain and consciousness, so that it can help us here and now. Yeah my dear friend and brother. Yes. There is only one thing for you to do. First in this wise, give thanks for the realization you have that you are attending school, as you call it, and you have well termed it, then continue with the desire to remember. Let you desire be expressed in gentleness. However, not in a commanding or mandatory manner. Before entering the sleep state, let that desire be preeminent in your very last waking thoughts. Let it not be that I must remember, that I have to remember. It is my desire to remember, that I may share these blessed experiences with those who are less fortunate than myself. If the desire is not answered immediately do not become discouraged. Unto the present hour your discouragements have been few, so proceed on the path which lies immediately before you. May I assure you that with your desire, earnestly and lovingly expressed, you shall bring back into conscious activity all of your experiences. At first they shall evidence themselves as new ideas. 
Perhaps you shall wonder how come this idea. Accept it as a memory picture of that which took place while you were in the school of the infinite cosmos. I leave this thought with you, please. Much of that which you have shared, beyond that which you have gleaned from books, has been the reflection of experiences you have had while dislodged from the moral coil. It does not all happen in that which you call the sleep state. They are actual living experiences. You may sit in this chair or any other chair and during the period of prayerful meditation. And may I use this expression, please soar into the vastness of the eternal universe and there meet kindred souls and return to your physical body with a complete picture of all which has taken place. Student, may I ask another question? One of our group, several times during the last week, nearly left the body. Can you analyze that situation? What is the next step? Can you analyze that and tell her what to do? I am to understand from your question that during this period of silence, mental quiescence, or meditation, call it what you will you felt as though you were leaving your physical body? Student, I felt very light. I felt I was about to float and everything appeared different. Splendid. Student, everything seemed opaque, nothing was solid. Beautiful. Student, nothing appeared solid. I was a little frightened and I wondered whether it was advisable to proceed. My dear friend, would you become frightened if your beloved helpmate would place his hand in yours and say, Come dear I have something to show you in the adjoining room. You would have no fear would you? Student, no, I would hurry to meet it. I would welcome it. Yes, will you do something please? Student, yes certainly. From this very moment my dear one, annihilate from you thinking every last fragment of fear, remember. Student, fear of anything or anybody. Fear of anything that is. No evil can come nigh your dwelling and I am speaking of your physical body. I am speaking of the astral body you are building with the precious thoughts you send forth. Student, why is it that the still small voice that used to instruct me so very audibly, why hasn't that been with me more frequently of late? I do not mean to speak to you in terms of reprimand, please understand me. Student I do I do. The very thought of fear has closed the avenue through which the still small angelic voice spoke, as you termed it. Student, can I undo that which I did in my stupidity? Can I undo it? Look, let us not call it stupidity, my dear one. Let us rather say misunderstanding, shall we? Blessed are you. Can you undo it? Yes, you have already undone, by expressing your willingness to do. We are not here to ill-advise you. We have been attracted to this home through what you on the mundane sphere of life call a strange manner. Yet it is not strange, may I say it is rather in and around the mulberry bush manner. We have visited with you quite often, not only here in this home, but in previous places of abode. We have been with you, dear ones for what you would term a long time. Now back to your question. Please do not fear. When you have this experience, learn to say this I am in perfect accord with the perfect idea, of the perfect universe, with the perfect universal soul. Remember dear hearts your soul is a reflection of the great oversoul of the universe, and in your quest for spiritual truth, spiritual growth, your soul has become enlarged, as it were in the fullness of the great oversoul of the universe. When again you have this experience, express a willingness to join the innumerable hosts. I assure you nothing of evil shall befall you. Student, thank you. How can we, how can all of us best serve the White Brotherhood Council? In capacity are we best fitted to serve? My dear ones, as you have served in the past and as it is your desire to serve now, in that which you have learned to call the future, expressing love as you have expressed it. Be of very great courage. May I say it in this wise, my dear ones, be of a stout heart and in your soul's consciousness at this very moment, let these words fall from the lips of the inner voice, I let go and I let God. I surrender, fully surrender, in love and wherever there has been a moment of discord, I grant peace in abundant measure. Good night dear hearts. Bless you, bless you. Chapter 4, True Communion and Purification P. 
peace, power, and abundance ever remain your goodly portion. Upon our first visit with you dear ones, we quoted a few lines of verse. May we be privileged to preface our visit at this time with a repatriation of those words. They are simple and no doubt you are familiar with them. They are in this wise and give expression to the all-inclusiveness of everything that is. There is part of the sun in the apple. Part of the moon in the rose. Part of the flaming Pleiades in everything that grows. Out of the vast come nearness. For the God of love of which man sings. Has put a little bit of his heaven. Into every living thing. I trust we shall be able to bring you a few morsels from the great table of life, for you will remember the words of the psalmist of old when he said, Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of men enemies. Will you visualize this table in consciousness? It is the table within the Holy of Holies upon which rests the golden platter, wherein is placed the shoe bread of life and at either side there stands the golden candlestick, in which there is placed the seven candles lighted, symbolizing the seven planes of spiritual consciousness. Where shall man find this table, but within the inner sanctum? How long shall man remain satisfied to grope in the darkness of superstition? It is blessed that we find you here assembled, anxious and ready to partake of the bread of life in the midst of the glowing flame of purity. Blessed are you among all mankind, for he who pauses during the material turmoil of the fate to elevate himself in consciousness, Truly he shall not knock in vain, neither shall he seek to receive not. With power the word were spoken, knock, and the door shall be opened unto you, seek and you shall find, behold I stand at the door and knock. But, this door must be opened from the inside and we find the door of your soul's consciousness, not just standing ajar but wide open, ready eager to admit the living, all abiding presence of the great I am consciousness of the universe. I am has sent me. It shall not be too far hence, when the scales of physical blindness shall be removed. May I repeat physical blindness for there is no spiritual blindness. Let that become rooted and grounded in consciousness. What causes that which we refer to as physical blindness? Only that which is perceived by the five physical senses. Within the inner tabernacle, the secret place of the Most High, the inner court, the Holy of Holies, call it what you will there abides the spiritual light of God. And it permeates seven vital centers in the spiritual body and thus reflects in the physical body. How is superstition and mortal contamination removed from the deceiver or mortal mind, carnal mind? Man for eons of time has been quite satisfied to maintain his residence in the five unregenerate centers. There comes a time however, whatever it may be, when man seeks to know more of his God. Sometimes and quite often it is brought about by some physical chaos and though man has denied the beneficence of prayer, if it but be three words uttered, God help me. And those three words, sincerely uttered, are also efficient. What takes place? There is a mountain referred to in the Holy Writ called Mount Zion. Where shall we in consciousness find that mountain? We will find it in the uppermost part of the physical structure. It is quite commonly referred to, in reference to two glands, the pituitary and the pineal gland. Some prefer to say the pineal, we desire to refer in this manner, the pituitary and pineal. There is the dwelling place of the great I am the source, creator of the universe. How is the ascent made? Through desire, dear hearts. Do not try to discard on partial of that which you have perceived through the five physical centers. Take it all with you and as you begin the ascent to the pinnacle of Mount Zion, to the dwelling place of the indwelling God, the power of the seven illuminated centers shall descend and as they do they shall purify that which is unregenerate. And unto he who followeth me through the regeneration, I shall give unto him the power to reign with me, upon twelve thrones. Man must reign upon the five physical thrones but he must reign upon them with the regenerated power. They shall become sheep in the pasture of the great shepherd and no longer wolves of destruction. Much has been spoken and volumes have been written upon the power of free will. Man is free, free indeed, but there is an unregenerate will. Man is free to taste of that will but when he has come to the bottom of the cup and tasted of its bitter dregs and cries, Abba Father, the regenerated will, which is indeed free will or the will of freedom, shall tear from his eyes the scales 
loose from his hands and feet the shackles that bind and in the freeness of the living God, he shall stand before the table laden with the abundance of spiritual food and there he shall feast and no longer of the forbidden fruit. Knock beloved, the door shall be opened. Seek. Ye shall find. Ask and it shall be greeted unto you, for the great oversoul of the universe shall never place in your hand a serpent instead of a fish and neither shall the great oversoul of the universe place in your hand a stone instead of bread. Within your consciousness is the well of living waters. You have but to drink of it. Truly it shall become the wine of life unto your souls. Remember you are the Christ of God incarnate in the flesh. You are the honored guest at the wedding of Canaan. Turn the water into wine, dear hearts. Drink of it freely, for it shall cause the marrow of your bones to become rich, and the fiber of your body to become strong. Fear not to ask of the great creative power man has learned to call God. If you ask in small measure, in a small measure you shall receive. Ask in abundance and abundance you shall receive. Remember, dear hearts, never forget these, my parting words. Share when you can, in the measure in which you have been prospered to share, if it is but a kindly smile, the warmth of your hand in the hand of another. Your hand placed in benediction of love upon the weary brow. Share, dear hearts, for as you share, you coffers shall become filled, your granaries shall become filled to overflowing and the window of your heaven, the doors of your heaven shall open wide and shower upon you innumerable blessings. This law is in your keeping. Use it wisely. Do not measure yourself short with the your stick of judgment by measuring the frailties of you fellow man. We thank you for this opportunity. Bless you. Bless you. Peace, peace, peace. So mote it be. Chapter 5, Have No Fear, God is Your Banker. Greetings. Thou in whose image and likeness we are created, in spirit, and in truth. Thou whom down through the ages we have learned to call God. We give thanks for thine innumerable blessings, and before the altar of righteousness, we would lay our gift and go, forth and make peace, but to return before the altar and offer our gift. We then thee, Father, for thy greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. We then thee that in this great plan, there is no death, that at the proper moment and the proper conditions, we can hold communion with those of our loved ones who have preceded us through the change called death, which is but a transition. Thou art a gracious God. Somehow, Father from the innermost depths of our being, we do not ask of Thee, we come not with pleading, we rejoice we give thanks. Thou art a kindly God. We have beheld the star in the east and may we never remove our sight from the brilliance of Thy love. And as we approach the season of the year that man has set aside for the adoration unto the infant Jesus, may we behold the true significance, the birth of the Christ within. Father, may we know nothing other than to share thy love. As best we know how, infinite heart, we surrender our body soul and spirit to thee. Use it. Somehow may it become of greater service than in that which we have learned to call the past. Through thy infinite law of love, we shall return to the altar after having made peace with thy children, and with our fellow man. Accept our humble offering. O man. Fear not, O man of earth. Love is the guiding light. Cast not thy gaze toward thy feet for within behold the light. No stumbling blocks along your path, no pitfalls you shall find. Put thy hand in the hand of God. He will lead thee. Free, thy step shall be. Unfettered thou shalt walk. No power, how great of small it be, shall injure thee in thy walk along life's road. One step at a time, with even stride, with thy hand in the hand of love. What shall we share with you this evening? What is your desire? We are at your bidding. Student, how should we proceed to share these lessons? Have you any suggestions? I am very happy that you placed it in that manner in which you have, have we any suggestions? We never advise, we never command, neither do we make demands. It is ever but a suggestion. My dear one, our suggestion is in this manner there is, as we have given to you in previous lesson, but one. Idea. That is the supreme idea, 
the perfect idea, the God idea. Whatever you desire, the sincere desire of your heart's consciousness may be, you shall recognize after you have given this through spiritual deliberation. We suggest that you hold it in the uppermost chamber, as it were, in consciousness. Bathe it with love, and when it shall have become a part of the divine idea, it shall be revealed to you. You now have a desire of what you would like to do. It is not an error. However, do not act in haste. The perfect plan of man bears fruit when it becomes correlative with the divine idea. It has as ascended from the depths of mortal conception, through the light of spiritual love, and arises and make contact with the perfect idea. Thus man experiences that which he has learned to call success. Many a well-laid plan has become dashed to pieces upon the rocks of despair for the reason that it never reached the sanctum of the divine idea. All success that man has ever known or shall know, is that plan which has had its birth in the womb of divine idea. While I am speaking to you, I am mindful of certain ones here in this group who are slightly confused, due to the fact that recently several doors have been closed and seemingly prevented them from that, which in mortal consciousness, spelled progress to them at the time. It is unnecessary for me to single you one from the other. You know to whom I speak. Be not discouraged, children of the Father's house, be not discouraged, for never has a door closed, but what it shall open again, and beyond that door there shall be open portal to which you shall find no doors. Never acknowledge defeat. It has been so said that opportunity knocks at man's door but once. That is untrue. It only becomes true to the degree that man may hear it but once, for the reason that he becomes confused. Opportunity knocks with every breath you breathe. God is not a God of limitation, but as we have previously stated ageless, birthless, deathless. You are children of the living God. What then is your inheritance? Is it less than the Father's? It cannot be. May I leave that passing word with you? Before you ask, decide what you are going to do with that which is granted to you after you have asked. Let your prayer be not in a beggarly or niggardly manner. Let it be a selfless prayer. Erase the small s from the word self and in its stead place the large s or the capital S as you would term it, the divine self, the oneness with the great oversoul. Your God is an eternal banker. Resources of the universal are at his command. It needs must be. He is the creator, and to your credit, as a child of God, there are many negotiable drafts written. You are now in consciousness in possession of every spiritual draft the Father has written. They are written in your name to your credit. Acceptance, receiving, appropriating it is that simple. There is nothing complicated in your relationship to God. Man has complicated matters, if I may use those terms. Man creates his own problem. Will you place your signature upon the drafts you now possess and go to the Father's bank and pass them, as it were? to the paying teller and receive your abundance. Are you asking me, how shall I place my signature? You are justified in asking this question. Here is the answer, full and complete surrender to God. But you will say to me, that is rather lame advice, a lame suggestion, is it not? Are you telling me to become unconcerned with the things of this world? Ah, no, my dear children, not so. There is a manner in which to become concerned with the things of this world, as you would say, spiritually concerned. Steeped in the depths of mortal reasoning, man becomes confused. Hear me. Cash you check. Receive your spiritual riches and you shall be able to cope with that which heretofore has spelled confusion. Have no fear. Our visit shall be very brief. It is our desire that you continue your visits one with the other. Discuss the happy experience you have had, talk of the blessings you have experienced, and in the inner depths of your soul's consciousness, nurture that of good. Nurture it silently that of good, which you desire to share with your fellow man, then it shall become as fertile seed sown in fertile soil and it shall bring forth its own fruit, after its own kind. Have you ever stood beneath the branches of a stalwart oak tree and, looking up at those branches, Behold a tiny acorn dangling from a tiny twig? What is in the heart of that acorn? The acorn knows only this, 
I shall fall to the ground and, undisturbed by man, I shall find myself nestled in the bosom of Mother Earth, and I shall become a mighty oak, and upon my branches shall hang acorns, myriad in number. Sons and daughters of the Father's house, you are mighty oaks in the Father's forest. Your branches of love hold acorns myriad in number. They shall fall. Let them fall silently, lovingly, tenderly. Do not disturb them. Let them find lodgments in an aching heart and they shall spring forth as a mighty oak. Thank you, good night. Chapter 6, Mortal Will vs. Divine Will In the bond of spiritual friendship, we gather with you before life's altar, above which burns the flame of purification. The altar not made with human hands, moreover with precious jewels of love and the flame unfed by human hands. Since you are not alone but moreover in attendance by some member of our council, your brothers in spiritual love, we are mindful of your every summons. We recognize that we are free to talk with you and not particularly in a manner of chiding in the least wise. Each thought, whether it is formulated in speech or not, sends forth its particular radiance. As soon as man of earth thinks, his thought becomes an illumination and it disturbs the ethers, thus creating a summons. The author of the book of Ecclesiastes, in your present holy writ, and I say in your present holy writ gives man among the many statements, this statement. In the making of many books is there a great folly. Therefore the teacher sets into being acceptable words. It is wise for man to gain knowledge. Solomon, whom man has called the wisest man, was wise, but not the wisest man. God man is the man of all wisdom. God man is the unwritten book, the Akashic record of life. We have no quarrel with man's desire to glean knowledge, Solomon said, get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing, and with all thy getting get understanding. As you of the earth plane express yourself relative to time, some time in what you have learned to call the past, in this present itinerary of life, you made this statement, I wish we could find some manner in which to clarify all that which seems rather misunderstandable to us. Is that correct? Student, that is right. During our first visits with you, and may I refer to them please? We made this statement. Always remember it. We impose no hardship, we make no demands, and neither do we command. You are desirous of understanding the potency of will? There is but one will and that is the will of God. Some man of earth has coined this statement, the longest way round is the shortest way home. That is merely a figure of speech but the direct route to the Father's house is the shortest way. In previous lessons much has been said of love and you shall continue to hear of it. That is the first step upon the path, which leads to the perfect will. You have read of the life of Gautama Buddha? Have you come across this experience in his life? In the life's journey of Buddha he was confronted by one who was antagonistic to his teaching. The individual vilified him, upbraided him, and Buddha, Gautama Buddha stood in reverent silence. Let us consider love and silence as handmaidens along life's path. Because of the continued silence of Buddha his accuser became caustic in his accusations and finally, when he had exhausted all his mental bombast, Buddha replied in this manner, My brother have you finished? His accuser replied in this manner, I have finished, but I am not your brother. Love expressed itself. Buddha's reply was in this manner, We are brothers, you are my brother. Listen carefully listen, this will answer something for you to his accuser Buddha said, If you were to offer a gift and it were not accepted, whom would remain the recipient of the gift? And after some mental contemplation his accuser answered and said the giver or extender of the gift. Buddha replied in this manner, My brother you have well spoken and all that of vilification you have offered me, in love I refuse to accept. Therefore, you the creator of this gift, are the recipient and it remains with you and only through love can you return it to his source of nothingness. Listen dear ones, why have I asked you to listen patiently? May I answer it for you? Along life's path, not that we were disagreeably inharmonious, and when I say along life's path I am referring to previous incarnations, you as all others, who have crossed life's sands, were young in your soul growth. 
there were mistakes which man has placed in category of error. Error perhaps is the better manner in which it be expressed. Now, let men return momentarily please to the words of the Galilean when he said, Forgive us or debtors. Not transgressors are debtors, as we have in equal measure forgiven our debtors. That is the original statement in Aramaic. Through translation crowded with erroneous thinking on the part of mortal mind, it has been prostituted to read, as embodied in your present writ, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The humble Galilean went on in his elucidation to make this statement, for if man forgiveth not his debtors, God cannot forgive his debts. Men of earth who have branded themselves atheists. And there are no atheists man may become agnostic, but in the true sense he never becomes an atheist. Impossible. The breath of life he breathes, the blood as it pulsates through his body, that which he accomplishes is in his, consciousness a mute recognition of the life principle of God. But the atheist says this, your God is unjust. He will not forgive you if you do not forgive. Let us analyze the statement. How is forgiveness brought into being? Man must give the new for the old. Where does man find the new? In the heart of love. May I make this analogy please? If in this room you desired to place new furnishings and you placed them here in the midst of the furnishings, which are now in this room, they would not harmonize perhaps, would they? Your room would become overcrowded. What would be your first procedure, dear hearts? To remove the present furnishings, is that right? Now we are approaching the avenue of reason. Give the new for the old. Man must make a complete eradication of the old, that God may have complete possession. If man holds on to old grudges, how can God become supreme ruler? Does it make sense? And if the original scripture were brought down to present day man, uncontaminated by erroneous translation, to suit the mental whims of the translators, man would know the truth of his oneness with his God. Why am I relating this to you, dear ones? We heard you make this statement that you demanded of God you did not demand. What did you do? Forcibly you cleaned the chamber of all clutter of the past, all the accumulation that gave evidence in the physical body of distress, you removed. You did not demand of God. Student was I wrong? Indeed not, I prefaced my statement did I not? We were in agreement with you. What did you do? You spoke of it as a demand, but dear one you became in absolute agreement with God. You accepted, in its fullest measure the perfect idea. You made no plans, did you? Student, no. Did you say I shall do this or I shall do that? I shall do this or I shall do that. No indeed you are not caustic in your statements, you are not vicious. Let us consider another statement of the humble Galilean, he said, listen carefully, agree with thine adversary, agree quickly with thine adversary, while thou art in the way with him, lest the adversary deliver thee to the officer and the officer deliver thee unto the prison chamber and thou shalt not come forth therefrom, until thou hast paid the last farthing. Now I have purposely made an omission, that I may repeat, the statement, here is the statement in its full content, agree quickly with thine adversary while thou art yet in the way with him, lest the adversary deliver thee unto the judge, false recognition, false accusation, and the judge deliver thee unto or cast thee into prison, prison, continued recognition of mortal torment, and thou shalt not come forth therefrom, until thou hast paid the last farthing. You agree with the adversary. Quickly you beheld the adverse circumstance, and you passed no evil judgment, hence your release from the prison chambers quickly. Let us consider the word agreement. It is not as man of the present day interprets the word agreement behold the error, become cognizant of, recognize that of error and release it and in doing so accept freedom. May I in graciousness ask one favor of you? Student yes indeed. Will you erase the word demand and in its place recognize the word agreement? You made no demand of God, for it is not necessary to make a demand of God. If there were any demand made, you demanded Satan to be gone. Student I understand. The satanic force of accumulated error and Satan said, I will clear this chamber, and God entered and the debt was redeemed. 
Let us go back to the statement of the Nazarene when he said, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Our good sister in what she has called a demand made that statement in a most emphatic manner. She said Get thee hence of thou evil. Therefore you cleansed the flesh and whatever man of earth did for your body was in accord with divine idea, the perfect will of God. All of love which you have shared along the path of life, all the silence which you have maintained in the face of every adversity, as Buddha stood in silence before his accuser, placed their hands together. Love and silence said, We are one. They preceded you on the path to the Father's house. Man uses a will which is mortal will. It is unregenerate will. It is a falsifier. It is a liar, as Paul termed it. And when it is eradicated from consciousness through love, through tolerance, through the silent avenue of prayerful meditation, the perfect will, may I say, expands in consciousness and in due season, envelopes the entire consciousness of man. And the mortal will is lost in its own eternal abyss of nothingness. Student, do you mean that in a sense, if we command error to leave through that command, as error move out divine will moves in? Yes, my brother. God is desirous of moving in. God's will is the perfect will. God is desirous of ruling that which he created. Student, what we have to do is to clean the house of our minds. Yes, man limits God. God is not demanding. God is not forceful. God is all tolerance, all patience, and when man becomes patient as unto God, when man becomes tolerant as unto God how does he accomplish this? Through love dear hearts, love is the first step, there is no other procedure. Listen to me, has it not so proven to be in your life? When adversity confronts you, with love make this statement, you do not exist, you are no part of God, God has not created you, you came out of the reservoir of eternal confusion. I will have no part of you. I am patient with God. God is patient with me. You understand dear heart? After man has emptied the inner chamber of all clutter, he fill the emptiness with love. It is as simple as that. It does not become necessary for man in the physical to extend his hand and say, Please forgive me. If I have wronged you. Your paths may never cross physically, but with ever breath you breathe, with ever thought you think, with every pulsation of blood through your body, your paths spiritually continue to cross. Muse in sacred reverence. Place your gift before the altar of life, whereupon this visit, we greeted you and in thought meet your brother. Would you feel in the least wise, indebted in this manner greet him all is forgiven, there is no malice, no contempt. We are one. Then lift your gift upon, the altar beneath the flame of purification and in humble genuflection accept the full measure of God's forgiving, healing, prospering, sustaining love. Student. Thank you we need this guidance, thank you. If I have helped you, may I take my departure. Before I entered, my dear brother, we recognized your thanks because of your summons to us with grateful supplication. We bid you adieu. Chapter 7, From Moral Consciousness to Christ Consciousness There is a way which seemeth right unto man but the end thereof is death, and in the realm of truth, man comes to understand that there is no death. What shall be done with the statement? Is it false? What is the meaning of death? Is it the extinction of life, the annihilation? I dare say not. How shall man define the word death, the word die? It is rather simple, not in the least wise complicated. It is from the ancient Sanskrit meaning to change. You will remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, Yeah, though I live, I die daily. Those words were well spoken and fortunately, through the various translations from the original scripture, they have never been changed. To many, those words seem rather contradictory. How could a man live and die daily? You will remember likewise the words of Job when he said, If a man die shall he live again. It sounded as through Job were questioning the possibility of the continuity of life. No, Job was not questioning. Job said, how can a man live and ever die? Job was positive that life was everlasting principle. 
to die is to become free from all that which is no longer useful to humankind. What happens to man when he has a change of thought? He continues to move about among his fellow men, does he not? What has happened? As the orthodox theologian says, he has become crucified with Christ. Now let us clarify that statement, if we may. But first let us separate the mixture, as it were. Christ is power. Christ is the incarnate power of God in form, or in physical manifestation. Jesus was the man and I dare say was a man unregenerate until by revelation through elevation in consciousness he became aware of his Christhood, his sonship, with the Father. It was the physical body of the man Jesus which experienced crucifixion and you will remember, the body left the spirit. The spirit did not leave the body. Unto what did the Apostle Paul die daily? Unto the error of the unregenerate will. How? Through the purification of his thinking. You will remember that the Apostle Paul likewise said and listen. Carefully, dear hearts, to this statement let there therefore be in you, the same mind as was and is in Christ Jesus. Not Jesus Christ, Christ the power. Jesus was a mortal man. You will likewise remember that the humble Galilean said, Marvel ye therefore not at the things which I do, for even greater things than these shall ye do. Likewise he stated, and unto he who followeth me through the regeneration, when the Son of God shall set upon his thrones, over the twelve tribes of Israel, over twelve thrones, upon twelve thrones. He who goes forth, my dear hearts, in quest of spiritual growth, spiritual beauty, is Israelitish. He is of the tribe of Israel. He has progressed from the land of Egypt, from the darkness of the unregenerate will has passed through the Red Sea of superstition and is moving on to rule upon the thrones in the Holy of Holies, in the inner sanctum with the Son of God. How shall he rule with the Son of God? In no other manner than to rule with himself, for is he not the Son of God? Does man incarnate in the flesh become the child of God, the Son of God, because he ascribes himself to some ecclesiastical rule? I dare say not. How is this brought about, dear hearts? Only in one manner, through the regeneration through the regeneration of moral will, into the perfect will of the only God of the universe, the living God. What is the first procedure? First we shall give recognition to the fact that there is but one mind and that is the mind of God. Man has no mind. I pure spiritual essence, man is mind. Man is pure unadulterated substance but hellest his way in the wilderness of Egypt. You are all acquainted with the parable or the story of the prodigal son. It therefore becomes unnecessary for me to relate it to you in detail, but remember this part of the parable. When the son had become tired, as it were, of feeding upon the husks, not even the corn, just the husks, he said, I shall return to my father's house, for therein is plenty. And may I call this to your attention? As he returned. The father saw him coming afar off, for the reason that through the son had diverted his attention from the father, the father had never taken his sight, his attention, from the son. Let us consider the remainder of the story in symbolism. The father called for the servants to bring forth the scarlet robe. Scarlet, symbolic of love. The robe symbolic of protection. The father called for sandals and he placed them upon the son's feet the feet symbolic of understanding. New sandals, please remember, clothing the understanding with protection, the newness, the fullness of understanding. Understanding came to the son while he was feeding upon the husks. And the father placed upon the finger the golden ring, gold the precious metal, the ring, without beginning, without end, symbolizing the oneness of eternal principle in God. The father commanded that the fatted calf be slain and the feast be prepared, symbolizing, dear hearts, the spiritual abundance of the father. All of this, dear hearts, all of this and more and more and more belongs to man. It is his. It has been his priceless possession from the beginning. But he has not accepted it. Therefore the unregenerate will shall pass through the crucifixion. It shall pass through the change of death. I shall die but to live. I leave you with this closing statement. The humble, 
lowly Galilean in the prayer of prayers, admonished man to pray after a certain manner, and in that prayer, he embodies these words, and forgive us our debtors as we have forgiven our debtors, and he completed that portion of prayer by saying, For if ye forgive not, for if ye forgive not. And in the original Aramaic, the remainder of the statement was written in this wise, How can your heavenly Father forgive you? What shall we do with the word forgive? We shall understand it to mean give up the old for the new. Dear hearts, all of that in man's affairs can never change until he gives up the old manner of thinking for the new. That is the first step upon the path of regeneration. It is unfortunate that man has been fearful, fearful indeed to invoke the perfect will of the Father, for the reason that he has been erroneously taught that pain, sickness, poverty, unhappiness is a punishment of God. That is a blasphemous error, blasphemous to the Almighty. The perfect will of God is health of body, peace of mind, plenty of everything there is, a comfortable home, an abundance of food, all there is in creation to bring every happiness to man. Man cannot blame his neighbor, neither can he blame God. Do not be afraid to say thy will be done, remember to say in earth as it is in heaven is to declare the regenerating of the five physical centers by the spiritual illumination of the seven spiritual centers so commonly referred to as the seven heavens. Yes, let man be agreed with the Apostle Paul as the Apostle Paul sought to free himself of the rebellious heart. One mind. One mind, dear hearts, the mind of God. And when man elevates himself in consciousness because of proper, constructive, spiritual thinking, he is rising out of mortal intellect into spiritual intelligence and returning to the Father's house, divine mind as the prodigal son in the parable we just considered. Bless you, dear hearts, bless you. Live in your freedom of your birthright in God. You are now children of the living God, join heirs from the beginning. And I say to you, there is no end from the beginning and there is no end. Eternity is now. There is no time. Distance cannot be. Memory holds as its cherished reflections, love is eternal destiny. Peace, peace. Thank you. Chapter 8, The Healing Power of Love We would like to engage a few moments of your time relative to the healing love of God. Jesus of Nazareth well understood the story of creation and when he said, in earth, as it is in heaven he was referring to the manifestation of the indwelling, all-abiding, ever-present Christ of God. The physical body he referred to as the earth for you remember he said, the kingdom of God is within you. And since God is ever in his heaven, therefore man must needs understand the heaven is a state of consciousness. You have listened to previous discourses relative to the illuminated center, the seven spiritual centers and the five physical centers. Together they comprise the twelve thrones. Throughout the physical body there are trillions of minute cells. They are intelligences in their own right. They respond to whatever message is sent to them. God is spirit, spirit is indestructible. Man is spirit, not a spirit. Man is spirit. Not in the image and likeness of God but the image and likeness of God. And since God is indestructible, Man likewise is indestructible and he should have long since known this to be not true, but truth, had he been properly taught. Therefore God is birthless, ageless, deathless. Man, his image and likeness is as God is birthless, ageless, deathless. When man says, I am this or I am that, which is spoken contrary to truth, he is blaspheming God. Man cannot be sick, neither can he experience poverty neither can he experience failure, only as he so declares it to be in his thinking. And that, he continues to do, as long as he remains a part of the unregenerate will. But when the five physical sense have become purged because of man's desire so to do, man no longer thinks in error, hence he can no longer speak in error. For man to say, I am sick is declaring that God is sick and that is error. That is blasphemy. For man to say I cannot do it, is saying God cannot do it. Each time man speaks in error, he is divorcing himself from God, but as soon as he recognizes his oneness with the Father, behold all things become new, new in consciousness. Therefore, 
when the physical body is in a state of ill repair, it is because man, over a period of time, has limited the action, manifestation of the power of God. Therefore, Jesus of Nazareth was expediently wise when he said, in earth, in the physical body, as in heaven, in spirit, in consciousness. As soon as man grasps the enormity of the great white light of truth, as soon as he learns to say, I am all power, I am all abundance, I am all strength, I am all health, he is dethroning that which he has given abiding place to, by the deception of the five unregenerate physical senses. Each time man says I am power each tiny cell throughout the physical body says, one to the other. Do you hear the command? We are power, let us be up and doing. Thus the giant of helplessness becomes the giant of power. Man has been led to believe that he must deny himself of all that which is good and live in the most, shall I say, impoverished manner, which that he may worship God. Why should God have created all things first and man last? But you will remember as the story is narrated in your present writ, in the book of Genesis after God had created man he said to man, What shall we name this? And what shall we name that? Truly God could have named what he had created, could he not? But the first expression of free will. Free will, free in the power of God. God gave to man to name and man has been naming ever since. But through erroneous teachings he has learned to name in error, hence he has gradually prostituted the power of infinite free will. A writer of hymns gave title to one of his hymns in this manner, My father is rich in houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the earth in his hands. And well did he speak. Listen dear hearts. Men and women have chanted, have sung, have repeated those words time over and time again have clapped their hands and stamped their feet and become elated over them and have said, Truly my father is rich in house and lands but to deny the very substance of which they were singing by saying, I must be very humble, I must not expect too much of God. That is inconsistent, is it not? Yes the father is rich. Truly he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, truly he does, and you are co-heir with the father. What belongs to the father belongs to you. Would you lie to read the Lord's Prayer in its entirety, the prayer that the humble Galilean prayed with the father? I is unselfish. It is beautiful. You will find it by reading the entire 17th chapter of St. John. That is the Lord's Prayer. The pattern of prayer you read in the 6th chapter of Matthew, from the 9th to the 15th verse, is a pattern of prayer after which Jesus admonished man to pray. If you desire to do a little comparison may I suggest that you correlate that prayer with the 23rd Psalm and you will make a discovery. For the psalmist begins by saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and the Galilean said, Our Father which are in heaven, hallowed, loving, adorable is thy name. Read them verse by verse and you will find that the Galilean is placing the twenty. Third Psalm in acceptable words to the great oversoul of life, the I am, all-pervading principle. When I tenanted a physical body, there was a very dear woman brought to me and all the doctors of her day said, You do not have long to live. Your heart is wearing out. You had better put all your affairs in order. Somehow at that early day, the voice of truth welled up within my consciousness and among the first revealings I had, came this statement for her, My heart is right with God. And, as this statement was revealed to me, it came as each pulsation of the blood. Listen. My heart, is right with God. The heart, the flesh heart is a muscle, dear hearts, and it is involuntary, as every other part of the body, and is under command of God. Do you have to stop to remember to breathe? I dare say not. Yet your lungs continue to expand and contract and the heart continues to expand and contract. Why? In the brain are cells and when those cells no longer function properly something happens to that particular part of the physical anatomy they control. Would you enjoy another morsel of good reading? You will find it in the very last chapter of the New Testament, in the 22nd chapter of Revelations and indeed it is a revelation. For therein you will read about the tree and river of waters and the tree bearing twelve manner of fruit, in its season. And the twelve branches and fell leaves upon the twelve branches, given unto the nation for the healing thereof. 
and nations wherever you find it mentioned in the scripture means man of earth, humankind. In the scripture you will read of the pillars of the temple of Solomon, metaphysically we will refer to them as the great ganglia, ganglionic system of nerves, the pillars of the temple of Solomon, the tree of life, if you please. And from the uppermost part of that tree are twelve cranial nerves. Listen, dear hearts, the twelve branches upon which you will find the leaves of healing. How is man to use God? Is God to be used? Truly so. Used righteously and never abused. Man shall use God by declaring God in truth. Therefore may I admonish with you, never hesitate, have no fear to say. Thy will be done. Chapter 9, Mental Diet In unity of purpose the words were well spoken, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. All power come from within and to whatever degree a man thinks, so he orders his conduct, so he attracts to himself those who are necessary to meet, to complete the fabric of life. As a man thinks, through desire he creates the environment in which he moves. Likewise well spoken were the words, it is not that which goeth into the mouth which defileth a body, for is it not caught up with the draught and becomes no more? But it is that which proceedeth forth from the mouth which defileth. As we discussed with you in previous communications, all things in moderation, and in this very sanctum when the hand of fellowship was extended, to you from our council, you were not asked to forsake or discard, only as your reasoning revealed to you. There are so many groups of people gathered together, who place stress and strain upon the care and keeping of the body, because of that which is eaten and that which is taken in the from of liquids. That seems to hold preeminence in their routine of discipline and their thinking is secondary. We suggest that the mental stomach be well taken care of with clean, pure, wholesome, mental food. The physical body is a laboratory in itself, and has been so created that its treatment in moderation will take care of whatever is accepted in the form of foods or liquids. It is likewise written, Be ye therefore not given over unto gluttony that statement is not alone relative to physical food. It refers as well to man's thinking. Man should be cautious in what he reads and how he thinks, as well as with food he eats, to sustain the physical body. Soul growth should be man's first consideration, and that is through thought. Man only speaks as he thinks. Personalities change. Man creates through his thinking the personality appropriate for every environment in which he finds himself, and that is through thinking. Likewise you will read the statement, All power is given unto man in heaven and in earth. In some translations you will read it in this manner, All power is given unto man in heaven and on earth but when man considers his physical body as the composite of physical elements, he shall understand that he has complete command over those elements by his thinking. Let us consider the farmer. He prepares his soul by plowing, disking, and harrowing it and placing rows upon rows in which to plant the seed. Certain rows or grooves are deeper than others, depending upon the type of seed to be sown. And so it is with man. As man thinks he plows, disks and harrows the soil of his brain and when he is in earnest, zealous, sincere, the rows he creates are deep. They are not shallow and the seed is therein dropped and carefully nurtured. Likewise you read the parable of the sower who went forth to sow some seed fell on barren soil. Some fell on rocky soil and was burned by the heat of the sun and perished, while other seed was sown in. Not on fertile soil. And the seed sown in fertile soil is the seed that produces the full fruition. Spiritually, man is a giant, spiritually, there is nothing impossible for man to accomplish. God-man never becomes defeated. Therefore, keep the mental soil well tilled and your harvest shall be great. Remember one of the previous lessons, there are trillions upon trillions of minute cells throughout the physical body. They are as stars in what you have learned to call the heavens, and when properly spoken to, shine and twinkle with the brilliance of power and so regenerated the earthly form and that brilliance of power and so regenerate the earthly form and that which man calls ill health, sickness, cannot exist. Remember it is not that which goeth into the mouth which defileth the body, it is that which cometh forth. Woe betide unto the man or women who suffer with mental indigestion. For it is as the farmer who sows various varieties of seed in the same rows. 
what would be the crop to come forth? So it is with man's thinking. Find the choice seed and plant it in deep furrows with love. Nurture them with patience and sincerity and there can be no lack, no want, no limitation. The crooked path shall become straightened and the dark way shall become brightened. The sun of love shall warm and bring forth in bountiful fruition, the seeds you have sown, the sun, the sun of faith. Truly the statement so written, through man's faith be no larger than the mustard seed it shall remove mountains. Man never encounters a mountain greater than doubt. Doubt is a deceiver. It is as the thief in the night. Remove it, remove it, do not let it come nigh your dwelling. Never doubt. Learn to say and learn to mean it, I am the all of everything of good. We have tried to give this lesson as an obligation to all, to the beginner as well as the scholar. I am leaving this one word with you, as you progress in your various duties as they shall be assigned to you, you shall at long last tear the scales from the eyes of the doubter, loose the hands and feet that are bound. Your work has been well laid for you. For the reason that you shall work together in harmony. Myriad are the ones who have latent talents, but for the reason they have felt underprivileged, they have kept them buried. Many have been denied the beneficence of those talents. So you dear ones shall find a place for each one and you enable them to express their talents and the fruition of talents comes into being, each shall share their talents with the other, the abundance thereof. And he who had been considered, himself shall rejoice because he has been able to contribute his portion to the community in which they live and to the world at large. Because at last shall come into manifestation, that which man has spoken of, has written much about and done very little about the universal brotherhood of man. I repeat, the yoke shall be easy and the burden light. Many hands clasped together in the bond of love make what man of earth calls a task, a duty, well done. Bless you. Peace. Peace. Chapter 10, What God is and How God Rules. Let there be no troubled hearts. Peace be still. Through the sun has set beyond the horizon's edge and darkness has found its way across the sky. God lives in all as well. Peace be still. The hearth is alive with embers bright. So let, within your temples, God's tapers flame light your path, peace be still. God lives in all as well. Have no fret and neither worry, nor in thought wonder. Peace be still. Look not afar beyond for God, but know that in your souls, his light, his flame doth glow. Peace be still and know that all is well. Live in light, the light of God. As you now know him in your soul. Let not of mortal tongue in error spoke, disturb the peace within your soul, God lives, and all is well. You sought him at a distance, in error bound and low within your heart, he did abound, now in truth, his life, his love, his light, his truth you have found. Peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. My dear friends, you have separated the wheat from the chaff and you have not discarded the chaff. And so well must it be. For you shall return to look upon the vessel filled with chaff and it shall have turned to wheat, dear hearts. Let not your quest run with idle race. Be firm, unmoved in all that which in mortal reasoning, man says is impossible, you shall find it to be not so. All things are possible with God. That which we leave with you in reference to scripture is not idly mentioned. Would he who goes forth into battle, use a weapon and not know how to use it? There is no other manner to convince man of his erroneous thinking that to show him the mortal discrepancy of the weapon he has been using. For eons of time man has referred to that which he has called the inspired blood of God. Man has become inspired to make records and he has recorded to the best of his ability and understanding. All that which has been mentioned relative to God, contrary to the truth of God principle, God man. God cannot be held accountable for, mortal man is a weakling in his mortal understanding. God man is not a power, God man is power and therefore must needs use the power he is. Let me repeat. There is nothing impossible with God nothing impossible with God man. May I use man's term of speech, mortal man's term of speech as you are familiar with it in the present day? 
What a sad affair it would be if God were as man has been taught to visualize him, in form, such as physical form, as you with the mortal eyes see your physical form when you look at it in the mirror. What a sorry state of affairs it would be, if God in such form were limited to the degree of thinking and reasoning, that mortal man is and there is the error. Man has not been properly taught, therefore man has conceived in his thinking, that heaven is some far off place. May I say geographically located? And there upon a golden throne ascended by a wearisome, toilsome ascent of many steps, man meets his God with the bomb of Gilead in one hand and the sword of wrath in another. Such has been the mortal conception of God. And such is untrue. There is a golden throne, dear hearts, and there is a power which rules and reigns upon that golden throne and that power is God. The golden throne is within your soul's consciousness and the God upon that throne is. Principle Listen with me. When man of earth thinks in terms of God principle indwelling, his physical body shall radiate the beauty of the indwelling principle, God. There shall be no worn lines of distress in the physical brow, neither upon the countenance. Man's physical step shall be quickened and no longer feeble and the physical hand shall no longer tremble. For the inner radiance of the living God shall have permeated every cell, every fiber, every muscle, every tissue, every bone of the physical structure. The stooped shoulder shall straighten, the uncertain step becomes quickened, the dullness of eyes shall become bright, the physical deafness become sharpened with spiritual hearing. Well did the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes know, when he set in order acceptable words. Listen to them. They have no conflict with God, dear hearts. They are in accordance with the God which you now know. Listen to them, remember now thy Creator, in the days of thy youth, the youth of spirit. And spirit never grows old. For as we have discussed with you, God is birthless. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, lest the evil days come and thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. As we mingle with mortal man we hear the cry of distress, the mortal cry, the mortal distress. We hear the which you call youth say, Why was I born? I hate life. I wish I were dead. There is nothing for me to live for. Listen to the words again, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. And the original statement said, Lest the evil days come, when thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them when the keepers of the house shall tremble. The wearing out of the nerve centers in the brain which govern the nerves of the body. The shaking of the arms and legs, palsy, man of earth calls it. Nerve deficiency, says the diagnostician general debility, says another wise man of earth. When the keepers of the house, shall tremble, when the grinders shall cease because they are few. Fell loss of teeth because of the lack of divine wisdom to take care of them. And when they who look out through the window shall be darkened. The failing of physical eyesight. And when the music in the streets shall become low. The deficiency in hearing, man of earth calls it deafness. Refer back to one of your previous lessons, dear hearts, when we shared with you the words of truth, that the physical body failed only because the centers in the brain governing the various parts of the body, no longer functioned properly. For eons of time man has heard of faith healing, healing by prayer and laying on of hands. Regardless of how the practitioner administers, healing comes from within. When God reigns supreme upon his throne, there is no confusion, there cannot be. Do not disregard God because man has misinterpreted God. You may call God. Him. He. She or her. It matters not how you refer to God by name. But in consciousness refer to God as principle. If mortal man would stop to reason how unfair he becomes in his judgment, in his criticism of his fellow man, he would have no argument with the God whom he has learned to revere or adore. For he could not expect any more from a God personal, than he could from himself, could he? Moral man is a lame weak creature and he shall continue so to be until as those of ancient age who knew the truth, worship God in spirit and in truth. Aramarthrustra or Zoroaster, Confucius, Buddha, Amenhotep of Egypt and myriad. Other teachers, whom I could name to you, with whom by word of mention you. 
would be familiar no doubt, were all the incarnate Christ of God. And unto men of their time in their own language, they gave to their peoples the principal God. What happened to your physical body when you devotedly and sacredly, with all reverence, intone the sacred Aum of life? You're remembering your Creator in your youth, for you are recognizing the birthless, youthful, indwelling, healing, loving, principle of the universe man has learned to call God. AUM, three letters. TAU, three letters. GOD, three letters IAM, three letters. All meaning but one power, dear heats God. GOD GOD. Infinite, all pervading, everlasting, undying, deathless principle. Be not confused, be not confused dear hearts. Whatever has served its purpose as you have traveled along life's path and you can no longer accept it in truth, discard it. For again may I refresh you to one of our previous lessons, live not in the past, lest the dust of the past consume you. Render unto Caesar, that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. God can only do for man as man accepts God. Listen, dear hearts, listen to reason. As a man lives in his thinking, so he creates the path he travels. A peasant one time said to a very learned man who was about to forsake God because he did not understand God. I am mentioning no names, but perhaps the statement will sound familiar to you. The humble peasant said, Foolish is the man who in mortal will thinks only of his body, and disregards the richness of God. No truer words were ever spoken and to the one who listened, they became as a consuming flame. They set him in consciousness, on fire, and he said, Enough, enough, you have spoken enough. I understand. You will remember the sainted Augustine who said, I hovel looked for you afar abroad and lo. Within my heart I have found you. Listen dear hearts. If there are those about you who are yet steeped in moral confusion, remember a previous statement of ours, do not measure yourself short by the yardstick with which you measure the shortcomings and discrepancies of your fellow man. I say this in love, I have no quarrel. Cleave fast, hold tight with a firm everlasting grip to truth as you have found it. For you are now, for you are now this moment, this very second, this very hour, facing in a direction which shall bring you into every freedom you have sought since your earliest quest, from the liberation of the bondage of confusion. Bet still, dear hearts. Upon the altar of your temple, in the presence of your God, behold the lightened tapers of his love. Be still God lives in all as well. Bless, dear hearts. Bless you, bless you. I bid you a fond adieu. Chapter 11, Cheating in Thought How blessed is man in the sight of God! How glorified is man in the sight of God! His greatness is as great as his Creator and his glory is of the fullness of God. Man's power is the power of God. Man's strength is the strength of God. There is no weakness in man and there is no limitations. Man is spirit, the perfect image, the perfect likeness of God. Whatever imperfections there may be, is the imperfection of the flesh. As true as the words have been uttered, so it is. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, many are called, few are chosen. Why should not all who are called be chosen? Only that man does not choose to accept. Why the appearance of physical infirmity in the presence of the declaration of God's truth? Why seeming continued infirmity? Why not an immediate response? Man, in his quest for health of body, peace of mind, success and abundance in all his affairs, too often is prone to forget and in so doing to look back. How long has man lived in erroneous thinking? How quick does man change his thinking? Error exists only in the manner in which man expresses himself in his thinking. The more he thinks of God and his relationship to God, his true relationship, the sooner the desired results become manifestly evident, in his physical body and in all his affairs. Quite frequently when man begins to forsake to the old for the new, he hesitates and will say to himself, Well, I will take a chance and indulge in a little bit of my old thinking. It shall not matter. I have yet time, I shall correct it soon, and all shall be well. And that is a mistake. 
to he who becomes. Shall I say spontaneously divorced, instantly divorced, instantly separated from the mass race consciousness, making the declaration to be not part of it ever, and making that declaration in all sincerity, it is he who is never prone to stumble or fall over obstacles in the path caused by improper or erroneous thinking, before his desire to travel the path of spirit. Sincerity of purpose must become established. And when there would become an appearance of a recurrence of something of the old, it is then at that time, that man shall remain steadfast, positive, in the complete surrender, regardless of appearance. God does not tempt his children. God's children are prone to tempt God, and how does this happen? Well, he who is not steadfast from the beginning is prone to say, Oh, I shall leave this all to God. There is no longer any need or reason for me to be cautious or careful. And that is to be found particularly among those who are yet desirous of holding on to the old and tasting of the new, and I am speaking of their first attempt in changing their thought. I can take a little chance, it shall not matter, God will forgive me. My dear ones, there is no need for God to forgive, for God has never held man in account. God has never judged man. God has never so feared man's body to pain, nor has he so feared his coffers to be empty. God has not caused persecution, limitation. Therefore, man but tempts himself. And should man stumble and fall along the path in his pursuit of spiritual fulfillment, he neglects to look back to the time when he did a little cheating along the way. Should there come a moment along or across the mystic's path when the clouds of distress hand heavy and low, let him take an inventory of his beginning when he first set foot upon the path of spiritual enlightenment and let him say, what have I done that transgression is now giving its appearance? Medical science has declared that physical pain is nature's alarm clock, telling man that there is something amiss in his conduct, and that is well founded. But medical science fails to recognize that that, which is amiss had its origin in man's thinking. Error thoughts are not erased in the twinkling of an eye. Therefore, when on is in pursuit of spiritual happiness and there comes the appearance of physical distress, financial lack, or whatever it may be, let that one say to himself, My prayer shall be more perfect. There is yet a little house cleaning of the old, or the past, it is not all gone. There has been a statement made by man, when man does not forget, he has not forgiven. And that can be well accepted, for unless man forgets all of the past, there is not room for complete forgiveness. Now remember, God has no reason to forgive. Man must forgive himself and man can only forgive himself his debt of the past he can only forgive that debt and redeem that debt, by completely forgetting. If there has been a habit, it must be erased. There is a danger in pushing it back into the thought chamber. For there it lays like the seed in the soil, and at some unguarded moment, a thought kindred to it may be planted alongside of it. Companion seeds are dangerous therefore man must ever be alert to his perfect oneness with the perfect principle. God. It is a very good mental exercise for man to indulge in during his last waking moments, just before sleep overtakes consciousness. And it is done in this wise, all of error which has surrounded me during my waking state is no part of me, I surrender to the fullness of God's pure sustaining love. I am his child and God is perfect. Or words to that effect, thoughts to that effect. And should there be, perchance, some tiny, lurking, undesirable thought from some action or some attraction during the waking hours, it shall be eradicated. Memory is dangerous when memory is not sweet and pure. Why does man, when he is seemingly sitting on the highest possible pinnacle of progress, find himself slipping and falling? It is only because, at some unguarded moment, even though it were a slighting, covetous thought entered his consciousness. And perchance he was totally aware of it at the time but said, Oh that little thought shall not hurt. I am strong, enough to overcome that. I am close enough to God, that that little thought shall not matter. And that is dangerous. That is what may be called taking a chance on the losing side of the ledger. We have used this illustration before. May we use it again please? Have you ever watched the tiny snowflakes bullet and faded about by the wind? Seemingly helpless little things, but one by one, 
they fall upon another. One by one they fall alongside of another, and gather and gather, until at last in numbers they become veritable mountains, mountains of strength, blocking mod of travel, making it difficult for man to get about. Tiny little snowflakes, seemingly helpless yet together becoming a great power, tiny little thoughts, seemingly unnoticed. Thoughts with idle concern are like the tiny snowflakes, one upon another, one alongside of another. The humble Nazarene understood the power of thought for he said, If ye forgive not, how can your father forgive? That is a translation as you read it. But the humble Galilean made the statement in this manner. If ye forgive not, how therefore can acceptance and forgiveness so become? You would not crowd a vessel from which you were eating with that which was unclean, for it would contaminate the food you had in the vessel. I am leaving this lesson with you, dear ones, for the hour shall strike when someone shall cross your path and with complaint, perhaps, question. Therefore, it is expediently wise to have the proper answer at the proper time, in the proper place. Our lesson at this moment is not in direct criticism of any one of you, dear beloved. But if you will contemplate the lesson it will prove to be of invaluable wisdom to you as you travel along the path of spiritual illumination. Good night. Chapter 12, Meditation Would you join us in a few moments of prayer and meditation? As you become physically calm, center your attention toward the tabernacle of the hosts by looking inward and upward and with a desire to behold the radiance of the white light, in foremost part of your head, in the forehead just above and between your physical eyes. You may not behold it immediately, it may take a little time. Whether it becomes a conscious realization to you or not, in prayer proceed in this manner. I am now in the presence of pure being. I behold no other radiance than the radiance of the Christ light of which I am a divine part. I am now fully conscious of the presence of the indwelling God. I now behold the living Christ of God, in whose image and likeness I am. I ascend in consciousness and stand before the altar, which I have created through my desire of oneness with the infinite supreme principle of the universe, that principle which has brought all life into manifestation. I am no longer part of doubt or fear. I am at peace with all mankind through the love of the living God. I behold nothing but perfection. I see all mankind in perfect spiritual accord. I proclaim peace on earth, as it is in heaven. Nothing can separate me from the living God. I send forth thoughts of love to all those who may be in understanding less fortunate than myself. I bathe them, spirit, soul and body and see them continually bathed with the goodness and greatness of God's love. There is no confusion in the universe. I see none. I hear none. I hear but the voice of God and I feel the presence of God's oneness throughout the universe. I see youth in all that which express life. I see life eternal. I do not, I cannot behold or become a part, for myself or my fellow man, of that which man has learned to call death. I see health, peace, life in every full measure of abundance wherever life is expressed. I am one with the living God, I see no defeat. I do not know of understand what man has called annihilation. Every good purpose, and every good deed. Every good ace, every good thought, continues its growth throughout the universe. I am now in the presence of pure being. And all of the which I shall ever become a part of, rests in the presence of pure being. I know no malice, no contempt. I am one with God and my fellow man. So mote it be. Dear hearts, let this be your prayer whenever you are in meditation, whether it be for yourself or for others. Let it not be just idle thinking but let it be thought with all dynamic power within you understanding. Be firm. Be positive, ere long it will, without any forethought you will see not only within, but around about you, the bright white light of the universal oversoul, that which man has referred to as the universal cosmos. Be faithful. Good night. Peace. 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 Chapter 13 God Man Greetings, bless you a thousand times, ten thousand, blessed is all mankind in the sight of God. Be fervent, loving, humble. Know that you are a child of God and there can be naught separate you. 
there is no separation in God. God and man are one. Man the perfect image and likeness of God, in truth, in pure substance, in the wholeness of life. Had man been properly taught, man would not recognize the error of separateness, from God. For you will remember the words of the humble Galilean when he said though I am in the world, I am not of it. I and the Father are one. And when the disciples marveled and the multitudes marveled in even greater measure, as to the manner of things which the Galilean accomplished, even before they voiced the spoken word he said, Marvel ye therefore not at the things which I do, for even greater things that these shall ye do, for greater things than these shall ye do. His greatest command was, Love thy neighbor as thyself. What in truth did the humble Galilean mean in that statement? Shall ye consider it, dear hearts? Love thy neighbor as thyself. When man has come into the realization that he is the image and likeness of God, not created in the image and likeness, he is the likeness of God, not created in the image and likeness, he is the likeness. When that becomes a conscious realization, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, with every breath he takes, he shall love God. And to love God is to love himself. To love God, to love himself, is to love his neighbor. Jesus gave unto his disciples a prayer, a pattern of prayers and not only unto the disciples, but he passed it unto the multitudes and down through the ages it has passed on down to humankind and the opening statement is this, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. God. Principle. Eternal substance, divine mind, God in heaven. The Galilean likewise stated the kingdom of God is within you. And God is always in his heaven. Therefore, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, are states of consciousness within the consciousness of man. Would you ask me if there is a difference in man? My answer to you would be this. There is a difference between men, but not with man. Remember dear hearts, remember man, man, g-o-d, both words three letters, and in God you have but one vowel. In man you have but one vowel and in each vowel throughout the universe from the beginning of time, as it is no though the scriptures, has had the vibratory action of the power of six. Six symbolizes accomplishment through action. So let us add the two sixes together of the O in God and the A in man and I believe you will agree that it digits twelve. Is the right? And the one and the two of twelve are three. And the three is the triune principle, the indwelling deity God, man, God man. But it is not quite so with men. Men for eons of time since the narrative of the fall of Adam. So called fall of Adam, has been prone to live in digression of God law. Why? For the reason that men are not, as an aggregate mass, God conscious. Why? For the reason that they have followed forms which in time, become fables and fancies. But God mind is God man and God man is God mind, and God man lives by principle, the principle of the living God the innate God. Not by form, not by fancy, not by fable. When man has elevated himself in consciousness he is at one with God. And when man is at one with God, truly at one with God, sincerely at one with God, he can see but the Christ of God, reflected in his fellow man. Therefore, he can in truth and earnestness pray that prayer, Our Father, all. Inclusive, Our Father in heaven. Then he is loving his neighbor as himself, he is loving neighbor as he he loves God. If I may use the language of you day, God is not interested in tags, labels. God is not interested in denominations. God is not interested in creeds, as man has established them or shall I say men have established them. There is but one creed in God mind and that is tolerance, brotherly love, the love of God beheld in all that which expresses life. Whether it stands upright and faces the sun, as your physical bodies do, or whether it creeps and crawls, whether it blooms in your garden or along your highways of life, whatever expresses the life of God is God's creation and God-man loves all that which expresses life. God-man is not interested in destruction. He is not interested in how he can cheat and take advantage of those with whom he lives. Whether it is in business dealings or otherwise, God-man is always willing to share. 
His hand is extended, palms up, and the palm filled, if you please. Men. Men. The aggregate mass, their thinking contaminated with the race consciousness, wholly unaware of the fact that they are living in the flesh embodiment for the reason that it is another opportunity to clear the error of the past. Man should of a long since know this truth, had it not been denied him through erroneous teachings. I tell you dear hearts, life is everlasting. And when men of earth have cleared the recorded and no longer have desire to return to a flesh habiliment, life continues in the celestial spheres which man has been taught to call heaven. Their man lives, no longer to become a denizen of the mundane sphere. However, there is an experience which man may engage in, if in consciousness he so desires to do. And that experience he may have after he has left, lain by the, the wayside, the mortal coil which he once tenanted. What is this experience? In a moment of quiescence, my dear ones, have you ever felt the nearness of someone about you and perhaps you were alone in the room at that time? Have you ever had the experience as though someone had touched you or a breath, as it were had passed upon your cheek? Have you ever had the experience of hearing someone walk in the room and then said to yourself, Oh, it is but my imagination. Be not deceived, be not deceived my beloved. Life is eternal. Men of earth do not have the power to call back as the term is used, those who have dissolved the mortal coil. It is not necessary. For after man has left his physical body he returns at will. Remember, beloved of the Father's house, love cannot die. God is love, God is birthless, ageless, deathless, and likewise is man. I tell you dear hearts, I tell you there is no death. Now then should man after he has become dislodged from the mortal coil, with no longer a desire or necessity to return to it, should he so desire to project himself, that his beloved of the mundane sphere may see him, that is possible. Do not be deceived by what you might hear to the contrary. I tell you that is possible. How is it brought about? In this manner. You will remember the words of Apostle Paul when he said there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So in thought, those who are dislodged from the moral coil clothed that thought, with the spiritual body, thus creating a likeness or a semblance of the physical form they wore when they were denizens of the mundane sphere of life. In the fraction of a second, as you reckon time, it is possible for you to see it. Has it happened to you? Perhaps, for I am aware as I am visiting with you that there are those of you here, in this sanctum, who had this experience but not disturbed by it. Do not anxiously covet it in the future. Moreover, be welcome in your thinking, be welcome in your thinking. At all times be ready to receive. To those of you who perhaps have not yet had that blessed experience, likewise do not reach forth for it covetousness, moreover say, you are welcome, my dear one, you are welcome, in God's love you are welcome. The greatest power on earth is the power of love. There is no power greater, dear hearts, I would ask you, to the best of your ability learn to say, and as you learn to say, learn to mean, I am at peace with man. And when you are at peace with man you shall be at peace with men. What are you decreeing, what are you declaring when you say, I am at peace with man? You are giving recognition in your consciousness that through man may error. As your man-made society beholds error though they may error, though they may bend and sway to unrighteous things, you are beholding the Christ of God in their consciousness. And I promise you, dear one of earth, the more you declare love, the more you express love, the more you shall quicken the consciousness of those whom you meet, the Christ of God, which they are not aware of. You have a sacred duty. The love of God imposes no tasks, God is not a taskmaster. You shall never weary, you shall never weary in service to your God. To the contrary, you experiences shall be happy. The distress of your physical body shall vanish. Should you eye be dimmed, it shall become bright. And should life have appeared to you as a problem, all that which has been problematic shall be dissolved, as you earthly snow dissolves before the vibratory action of the sun's rays. I am at peace with man. I am at peace with man, I behold in those with whom I move, no evil. I behold the perfection of God. I bear no malice, 
I bear no hate. I see no confusion. And when the opportunity presents itself for you to speak a word for the living God, as you learn to understand it, as it has brightened your path, do not hesitate to speak. But our word of admonition is this dear children. Never proselyte, never proselyte. Drop your seeds of love as you walk along life's path. Drop them with a blessing. Water them with the waters of kindness and perchance should it so become your lot to meet those whom at one time you met in dire distress, you shall meet them with a smiling face, a quickened step, a song on their lips, peace in their hearts. I am at peace with man and though I may be persecuted, vilified, and cursed, I shall give love. For God has created and sustained in love and it is because I have found God's love that I am enjoying freedom, I share it with my fellow man. Bless you, bless you a thousand times ten thousand, bless you, you are all precious in the sight and the presence of the living God. Chapter 14, Seeds of Creation Greetings. Peace abide with you. How good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Peace, peace. As beautiful as your physical day is, so is the beauty of that portion of life's pattern allotted to you to live, in this present physical itinerary. The light of God's sun in your heart's consciousness shines. Let nothing obscure its radiance. As the reed in the marsh bends in the breeze, so let your life be ordered in truth. Wherever truth is to be found, find it, and as the reed in the mash bends to the gentle breeze, so in your heart's genuflection, bow in acknowledgement to truth. Whether it is spoken across the lips of the man whose skin is black, yellow, bronze, or white, it matters not, so long as it is truth. In so doing, your message, as you deliver it, shall find favor. There is but one door through which all man must pass and that is the door of truth. Pass through it beloved, wherever and whenever you find it open. And should perchance, it swing closed and you know there is truth dwelling behind that closed door, never fear to knock upon the door and arouse the teacher. The true disciple never tires in his quest and the initiate is always gracious. The teacher serving God and God principle is never too weary and the hour is never too late. And when the seeming stranger knocks upon your door and you have truth to share, which you have, never say, Come tomorrow, my time is now spent. Open the door and welcome the stranger. For as you seek to have your hunger satisfied, many you will find of like desire. There are buried treasures to be found and man never becomes a pirate of the high seas to find hidden treasures. There is never a necessity for deception or theft as the story of the pirate of the high seas relates. Earnest desire. Earnest desire shall open all closed doors and unlatch every concealed chest and treasure box. Let your desire wax, and as it does, oh you shall always find the oasis in which to dip your cup and quench the thirst of your desire. Never forget the path of your past over which you have traveled to reach the height on which you now stand. Never forget that path, as you meet your fellow man of today as you understand today, who is traveling a similar path. As we discussed with you in a previous visit, growth is ever necessary. All nature goes through the experience of expansion and growth. Here, about your castle, as the warm rays of the sun kiss the earth, you shall plant seeds. You shall hold them in your hand, some very tiny, all similar in color, with a few exceptions, some larger in size, but dry seeds dry shells. And as you place them between your fingers and with some manner of apparatus, or another finger, you make a tiny groove or tiny hole and drop that seed. You then cover it over. You tuck it away to sleep and you wait, full well knowing that your efforts shall be rewarded. Remember all similar in color, with an exception of a few. But, within that tiny shell rests a heart. And after you have covered that shell, you do not see what takes place. What happens? Moisture and warmth of the sun, cuddle, nurture the heart within that shell. Then that little heart begins to expand and soon there is not longer room within the little tiny shell, and the shell bursts. What has happened? Why does the kernel or the heart within that tiny shell expand? Only for one reason. It is alive. It is part of the great cosmic mind. Therefore, 
it has been but asleep and when quickened by the power of God in action, it awakes. And here let me pause. I desire to refer you to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and therein you will hear the Apostle Paul speaking in this manner. He says, And God hath given a seed. Not man. Read it. Ponder over it, dear hearts. It is there. After God mind has expanded in that tiny capsule of shell, what is the next act which your physical eye does not see? There is a tiny tentacle which comes forth seeking moisture, seeking the waters of life. And, as it grows in length, there are other tiny tentacles which branch forth from it, seeking the waters of life, desire for further expansion and growth. You have learned to call them roots. What happens next? Regardless of what appears above the soil, this takes place. A tiny sprout, always magenta in color, rises to the surface of the soil and from within that sprout comes forth a green sprout. What lesson have we to consider? All colors of the spectrum of the aura are contained in white, the pure white. Light of the eternal cosmos. White, dear hearts, white. Remember it. What is the symbolism of the magenta? It is the combination of the highest pinnacle of life's polarity, and the other extreme, intelligence manifested in and through matter. And for your growth I ask what combination of colors create magenta? Red and violet. And where do you find red and violet in the spectrum? One is on the cool side of the spectrum and the other is on the extreme opposite. So, through the warmth of desire and coolness of tolerance, you have magenta. Look at your rainbow, one of God's great expressions. Where do you find green? In the center of the spectrum. Out of the warmth of desire and the coolness of tolerance, come forth life. Always symbolized by green. What was it the dove brought back to Noah? It was the green olive branch which told Noah that life still existed. As the tiny green sprout grows, it sent forth branches and upon each branch, regardless of the species of growth, there are tiny buds. Some buds bear leaves, other buds bear blooms, and the leaves shelter the blooms and the blooms create fruitage. On and on goes life, from the heart of God, bathed and sustained by the power of the eternal cosmos. Call it what you will by any other name, it matter not. It is ever the eternal cosmos. God in action. Man who stands upright facing the sun, has yet his greatest lesson to learn, from that which he in moral consciousness believes he controls, the lower forms of life. All man has to do is look about him and he finds at every turn of the road as he watches the response of nature, he finds that there is another book, which he has not yet read. It is the unwritten book of life. Some of your mundane teachers refer to it as the Akashic Record. Where is the midwife who assists the so-called dumb creature to deliver its young? Where is the midwife who breaks the waxen covering upon the bud of the tree and all other growth, to liberate the leaf and the bloom? There is but on midwife there and that is the great eternal midwife, the Creator, God. Beloved, you are beginning to read the unwritten records and as you read them and behold their beauty in all that express life, even rocks, for remember rock formation is not lifeless nothing is lifeless. As you begin to understand man termed wonders of nature you come closer to you God, and you shall understand the capsule in which you live. You shall understand how, when the seed was planted in the womb and fertilized by the ovum, it expanded, how the tiny white tentacles sought the waters of life and how the warmth of desire and coolness of tolerance brought forth the magenta, from which came the physical body you now wear. Again, may I refer to the Apostle Paul, for the path he chose to trod was anything but smooth, and though the lessons he learned he was able to say to those who became destructively critical in their opinion, be ye therefore not given over to appearances, for hath not God written his law in their hearts. That is sufficient. Man has coined this statement, you cannot judge the contents of a book by its cover, and that, dear ones, you have proven to be true. Let us never be deceived by appearances. We of the council never permitted to be, out of all walks of life, the lame, the maimed, the halt, the tall, the short, the lean and those of flesh, those of all colors and races, we make our choice. Bless you, bless you.
Chapter 15, Justice and Deception It is always our pleasure to greet you and throughout the length and breadth of your land the harvest is becoming great, and the need of laborers in the field of harvest becomes so very necessary. Time is rapidly approaching when there shall be more questions asked than orthodox theology can answer. In the very early 16th century a prediction was made, toward the close of the 20th century all religious systems would have become numbered in the heap of discard and man of earth through desire to know truth would make a demand. That demand is very close at hand. It is needless for me to state or to remind you, that not only in the field of religious systems, but among the men who have been entrusted with the affairs of nations, are those not living true to their trust. There is no great mystery to that, for religious systems have caused man of earth to become weak in his understanding of God, weak to that great task where he has discarded belief, belief in God, for that reason, spiritually and politically, the nations stand in jeopardy. There is a solution to the problem and we seek mundane collaborators through whom we may pass the message of spiritual emancipation. Mind you, we make no demand, ever, and we do not ask for those who represent us to resort to proselyting. You will find that the yoke shall be easy, and the burden shall be light. Mortal man who seeks to deceive his neighbor and all mankind of earth, become neighbor with neighbor. Though there be myriad in physical numbers, there is but on presence. One presence, the presence of the ever-living God. Therefore, regardless of how on man attempts to deceive another, he but deceives himself. It is unfortunate that man has become godless to the degree that he is ready to sell thirteen ounces for a pound. But whom does he deceive? Judas deceived and as the story is related, released his physical body from his soul. It has ever been thus and so shall it continue to be until man shall understand that salvation is now. Now is the day of salvation. It cannot be bought with thirty pieces of sliver. You will remember the story of betrayal. Judas held thirty pieces of silver in a leather bag and he held it in his right hand thirty pieces of silver. Three symbolizing his true inheritance with the great oversoul of life. And the knot of the thirty, the all-inclusiveness of which he was spiritually, and the leather bag, concealed the thirty pieces of silver. And thus man, within the treachery of his thinking, conceals his birthright. There are many a Judas, many a Thomas, many a Peter. Throughout the length and breadth of your land you will find many of such character. Listen dear hearts, the day of atonement is now. Now is the time for man of earth to make his repentance. Now is the time for man of earth to meet his maker. Not in the sweet by and by, for there shall be no sweetness in the by and by if man carries the bitterness of gall with him into the by and by. For he shall find himself as he has so conducted his physical journey. Let the waters of Mara be sweetened now, for there is no greater way in which for man to accomplish this, than through the law of justice. Each teacher in their time has taught the lesson of justice. There is but one way and that is for man to be fair, upright, with his fellow man. Dear hearts, do not worry because of the injustice dealt to you. Regardless of how unfair your fellow man has been with you, you are now looking at life, not through a glass darkly, but you are standing out in the open field. You have become monarch of all you survey. Would you ask me, what shall I do with that of injustice, of the past? My answer to you is this, cut it loose and let it go. For it shall find the womb from which it had its birth. You shall not have to direct its way. It shall find its own way, for remember, may I repeat a few words I left with you some time ago perhaps they will become sweeter music upon you ears than when I first brought them to you. Listen. There is part of the sun in the apple. And there is part of the moon in the rose. God truly has put his heaven into everything that expresses life. And the individual whom society brands the lower of the low, is a part of God. His mortal cunning, his mortal treachery, may have obscured his vision of God, but he is God's child, and regardless of how cruel his conduct may have been, there is only one picture to behold and that is the innate dwelling Christ of God. It spells freedom to you. It shall spell freedom to you. Hold no man of earth in contempt. Ever be free to say, you are God's child. And in your prayerful meditation, 
remember those who are less fortunate than yourself. Let your prayer of peace and love be universal, you are responsible to yourself. You are a child of the living God. Be their karma from age upon age, let not karmic debt trouble you, when you have learned to live in peace and freedom with your God. Man is responsible to himself and to himself alone. This I speak to you in truth. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners, said the apostle of ancient age. Be not deceived. Look not to any man-made ritual to absolve whatever misdemeanor has crossed your thinking. Such ritual, such does not exist. And I do not say this in any form of malice or ridicule. Do not be deceived. Learn, dear hearts, to speak with a smile in your voice and by no means ever, seek to bind your fellow man. With the same freedom that you would enjoy, render unto your fellow man that same freedom. In so living, there can be no accumulation of debt or karma in that which man has learned to call the future. If your fellow man would stand within your gate with his hands and feet seemingly tied and shackled, let your question be this, what would I do under a similar circumstance? Has your path ever been rough? Have you come to a place along life's path where your hands and feet have been manacled? Then you experienced release. Stop, contemplate your release and in prayerful meditation say to your brother, I cut you loose and free you in the freedom, the allness, the oneness, of the living God of whom we are both a part thereof. This is salvation. This is being born again. Then you have a perfect right to say, I am a born-again Christian in God full and complete surrender in heart, dear one, shall never cause man to speak in terms of enmity. Your name upon a scroll or roll, whatever it may be placed, is of no avail unless in spirit and in truth, your name has been inscribed upon the inner scroll, that scroll which is never scrutinized by physical eyes. Your name so placed, shall be recognized the length and breadth of the universe. Then you, can place your name to whatever man-made scroll may appear without fear of contradiction first within. The time is at hand, dear hearts, and it shall come to pass before your physical bodies have fallen away from your spirit and soul. It is rapidly approaching, when the prediction made in the early 16th century, shall be written across the length and breadth of the land. Church and shall have ceased to be and Christianity shall come into full fruition. Man can no longer deceive man for the Christian age is at hand. Each tyrant, in their time, each dictator, as you have learned to call them, each individual seeking individual supremacy has but goaded man on to seek, to delve, to fathom, to uncover, until soul restlessness is becoming a dynamic urge, as it were. And man is asking, why is this? Why has two thousand years and more of church and failed? You are coming into the possession of the answer. And our council, unseen to human eyes, the member of which are myriad in number, are seeking mundane collaborators. For at long last spiritual science must prevail and as the test tube in the laboratory reveals, that which the man of science seeks to find, so in your laboratory of thinking, you shall bring forth the perfect specimen in your spiritual test tube, please. A hymn writer wrote, Work for the night is coming. I say to you work for the day is becoming brighter. Man loses his way in darkness but he finds his path in the brightness of the great white light of cosmic principle. Let your labors be not in vain. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you good night. Chapter 16, Giving in Love Greetings. There is peace, there is peace. Proclaim it, dear hearts, children of the living God. There is peace. What man of earth can say there is no peace? What man of earth can truly say, I do not love? Let man be mindful of that which he loves, for that which man loves, he is a part thereof. 4. He has created that of which he is a part, in his desire. Never let man utter the words, idly so I love this so are I love that. There are many things along life's path man may be justified in saying, I like, but let him be cautious how he shall use the word love. The word love is power, therefore, man shall be mindful of that which he loves. Love is devotion. Unto what shall man ascribe his devotion? Each teacher, in their own time, 
unto their own people, have said, Be not given over unto false gods. There is but one God the creator of all that which is good. And, as you are acquainted with the story of creation, you will remember there were seven steps in creation, as you understand the story. And Spirit. God said, It is good. Then a pause as you understand the story, as we have in our previous visits discussed with you the story of creation. Creation has never ceased. All man of earth continue to create, and that which he creates is his own and no other man of earth has the power to take it from him. That which man creates, he gives, he shares, and in the measure in which he sends forth that which he creates, his well of creation never becomes dry and parched. What does man create? The word love expresses power, spiritual love, unselfish love. The love realized through the regeneration creates all of that which man can safely call good. There is an unregenerate love, dear hearts. You cannot love that in the physical which man knows as temporal for it shall pass away. It is your birthright to like it, and in a measure to possess it, but then too, man shall use it righteously. What had the Galilean to say of this? Did he not say, Lay up your treasures in heaven? Ah yes, we hear man of earth say, I am going to have all of my good now, I am not going to wait until I get to heaven. Well, there is no good for man other than the treasures in heaven, and as you already know from our previous visits, heaven is a state of consciousness. There lies your treasure. Here, now, round about you, that is where your love shall be centered, in heaven. It is an old saying and quite faithful and true that, man only keeps that which he gives away. Herein lies a seeming mystery. May we endeavor to share a few words of wisdom. It is not within the law of God that man should live in poverty, destitute. It is God's will that man shall have plenty, heaped up, pressed together and running over. I have no other word to leave with you than this, dear hearts, look within your own soul's record. Why have you prospered? Why are you able to share your goodly store with other? There is only one reason, it has been your desire to bring peace and happiness to your fellow man. You, dear ones, who listen to me at this moment, you are here in this present flesh habiliment because, in your previous experiences, you beheld the light of love, and as you may call it, circumstances, conditions of the mortal, hindered you from so fully expressing. Desire to express has brought you back into the present experience of life's eternal span. Why comes to the door of your physical dwelling, your fellow man with a troubled here, a throbbing breast, and a feverish brow? Why are you, dear ones, called upon to serve as ambassadors of peace, sharing your substance? As you sow in love, share it. Desire, dear hearts, and you shall never be called upon because of the experience of desire to share that which is not yours to share. Your well of love shall never become parched or dry and your physical resources, as you understand them, physically so, shall never experience poverty. This we assure you. Remember the words passed to man for ancient age, the only thing a man shall keep is that which he gives away. How can one continue to share were the well to run dry? In your holy writ you read these words, when you have it in your store, say not unto he who asketh of thee, come tomorrow. That is denial to yourselves. Would you ask me this question? Shall this be your question? How shall I know when to give and when to share and when not so to do? Listen, dear hearts, no one has ever come to you, and no one ever shall, only that one or ones who are worthy. Here on your mundane sphere are countless numbers and we speak not in the least wise derogatory, please who have full and plenty and unto whose door comes quite frequently one in need, but to receive this answer, I can be of no assistance to you. And unto the one to whom the plea has been made, they live on in the flesh experience, adding unto what they have, who lie unmindful of that of chaos and strife around about them. What does man bring into life, as man so says? and what does man take out of life, as man so says. And to that there is no mystery. Man brings into life. As he terms life, every blessing he has ever experienced and the results of every sorrow he has ever created. Therefore, the Nazarene knew when he said, Lay up your treasures in heaven, 
where rust doth not corrupt, moth destroy, and thieves break though and steal. The rust of selfishness, the moth of lustful desire, and the thief of deception. Love all of that which is good and be mindful never to say, I wish I possessed that which he possess. I love that which he has or she has. I would love to have that. Be mindful, dear heart's covetousness never. Let your neighbor live with that which is your neighbor's and thank God for that which is yours. A duty never becomes a burden or a task, dear hearts, and love never becomes an imposition never. Always remember as you continue along life's path, as you are mindful now of the truth, it is not I who doeth the works, but the Father which dwelleth within me. Inasmuch as ye do this unto the least of these my brethren, ye do it unto me. If it is but a spoonful of cool water to parched lips it is not I, but the Father within me. Our blessings are with you. Become not weary in well-doing. The seven steps of creation are here represented in this hour. There are seven physical temples in this room and one presence. Dear hearts, remember and never forget as man of earth becomes a blessing, as he bestows a blessing, he receives a blessing. From the full measure of the heart comes forth the blessing. We have made mention of this many times. We refer to it now in particular because of the season of the year, which man of earth is about to indulge in and engage in, the season of the year of giving. How shall man of earth engage himself or herself in giving? Shall it be with a freeness of heart? If so, be it a might or a might, man becomes a blessing. How shall man indulge himself or herself in receiving a gift? Whether it be a might or a might, lovingly, graciously, it shall become a blessing. Wherein lies the true value of giving, dear hearts? Is it weighed upon the balance with gold and silver? Ah oh, nay, it is weighed with love. As God created and as God continues to create, does God become engaged grudgingly or out of necessity because of a particular, season? How do man of earth indulge himself in the gift of God's creation? We so often times hear man of earth say, I have given lavishly but I have not received in lavish manner, hence, I shall give them no more lavishly. Until the gift has been recognized by some manner of equal return. And he or she who so engages oneself in giving, gives but to themselves a gift of limitation. There is joy in giving for greater becomes man's expanse of living. Oh! the joy of giving. Greater is the living in the hearts of those who love. That is heaven from above. Give and forget even that which you have given. Do not weigh it with Caesar's coin, for Caesar's coin bears a tarnish. It is well for man never to give than to give and be boastful of the gift. Therefore, the Nazarene stated, where your heart is, there also shall your treasure be. Likewise, said the Nazarene, let not, therefore, the right hand know what the left hand doeth. For your father know it in secret or in silence and shall therefore reward thee openly. According to his richness, God's richness in glory, shall your every need be supplied. And the Apostle Paul, said in reference thereto, Love flaunteth not itself, it is not pu fed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly seeketh not its own. It is better for man to scribe upon a tiny bit of paper these words, I love you. God bless you. And give it in love than to give a costly gift in earthly gold and shout its merit from the housetop. Silently, lovingly, dear hearts, from out of the innermost depths of the heart, with no expectation of return. When there is no expectation of return you shall have cast your bread upon the waters. They shall return unto you and you shall find them after many days, in the abundance of God's law, God's love. God's light. Cut loose your gift and let it go. Bless your gifts. Somewhere along the path the sun shall shine, a babbling brook shall sing, your parched lips shall be moistened. You will meet a smiling face. You will hear someone say, My brother, my sister, I love you. And should the way become dark and should the coffers become lean, the bead cast upon the waters shall erase the leanness of the coffers. Have you ever experienced an unexpected blessing coming to you through an unexpected channel? Have you? If you have, why has it come to pass? Only for the reason that somewhere along life's path you became a blessing to someone, a blessing from the innermost depths of your heart. 
Worry not. Rejoice. This shall be a happy season. And the season shall be as a seed, a fertile seed, planted in fertile soil. It shall grow, grow, and grow, because you have given in God's love with no expectation of return. Freely I give, I receive. Receive. Accept. Appropriate in love. As you send your gifts forth, bless them a thousand times ten thousand, for the joy that they shall bring in the hearts of the one who shall receive the gift. And your cup shall be filled to overflowing. Bless you, bless you, a thousand times, ten thousand, bless you. Chapter 17, Weaving Your Pattern of Life This is not an appeal to your curious thinking, for you are not curious, as man of earth is acquainted with the term. You are ready to receive. We have referred to visits of this nature as warranted errands. And you, dear hearts, are here as this sanctum, our sanctum, on a warranted errand. Worry not your hearts, become not troubled. Life has smiled most beautifully upon you. We are aware of the rough places in your path over which you have crossed. Look not backward. Moreover, fix you vision upon the star in the east, for it shines. And within your soul's consciousness there is a manger, and in that manger lies the wise man of old, the Christ of God. You have conceived and given birth to the wise man, and the three who knelt at the manger in adoration have left their precious gifts and gone their several ways. But the greatest gift is in your possession. Accept it, cuddle it, nurture it, suckle it well with your love. May I repeat the words of an ancient wise metaphysical poet in the following words. Would you know life abundant? Love doubled for all it gives? There is no means surer than helping someone to live. As you continue along life's path, clasping the hand of your fellow man, and as a statement is made, brushing shoulders with them, look for but one thing in your fellow man, the innate Christ of God. And you shall learn to behold the Christ regardless of the raiment which clothes the physical coil, regardless of whatever manner you may meet your fellow man. You shall learn that God is power, God is love, God is health, God is strength, God is all abundance. You shall only find yourself in physical want because you have failed to nurture the fourth wise man, the wise man in the manger. Your consciousness is the manger, dear hearts, and therein lays the Christ. Do not crucify your Christ. There is but one Golgotha's tree, dear hearts, and that is the physical body. The other tree upon which the physical man Jesus hung, has passed into its nothingness. The manner in which you conduct yourself, physically shall be in response to the manner in which you think. But would you ask me, why is it, I have to the best of my ability been kind, good? I have endeavored to live a clean, righteous life? And that question is justified. The humble Galilean was encountered by a very wise man, and the wise man said to the Galilean, What is required of me to inherit the kingdom of God? Tell me, O oh good Nazarene! And before the question was answered the Nazarene said, Why callest thou me good? There are none good but the Father. Yes, not even I, but the Father which dwelleth within me. The good of the Father, beloved, is you. You are the good of the Father. And every priceless possession of the Father is yours. You are the Christ of God incarnate. Forget it not. Now, why have seeming troublesome times confronted you? Why have you met with individuals whom you would say have caused you grief and remorse? Life is endless. Truly it is eternal. It is not a part of the divine idea that man should choose another physical form through which to pay his debts. That but happens through man's choosing. Likewise the humble Galilean made the statement, now is the accepted time. Likewise he said, is not a thousand years likened unto a day and a day likened unto a thousand year. And the universe in which you live, the Father's house, has stood longer than a thousand years, yet but one day. Likewise the humble Galilean said, So efficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And orthodox theology has misinterpreted, distorted, the words of truth which fell from the lips of the Galilean. Therefore he became provoked to say, What man is with honor in his own land, in his own country? Today is the day. 
that which you call yesterday is but a memory and that which you look forward to as tomorrow, becomes today. Let memory be sweet, wholesome, constructive. For man is as a weaver standing at the loom of life. Be mindful ever mindful of what you put in the shuttle as you pass it back and forth. For you are weavers, weaving a pattern. Life is full, but unto each individual, by the individual's choice, is given a portion of the great patterns of life to weave. The masses have never been reconciled to the fact of rebirth. But again let me take you to the words of the humble Galilean when he said, Ye must be born again and the counselor of law who stood before him, answered saying, How can I a man grown, enter for the second time into my mother's womb and be born again? And the Galilean said, I speak of the birth of the Spirit. Now, that statement has been confused by orthodox theologians for they are not yet agreed upon the fact that Spirit is birthless. What could the humble Galilean have meant when he said, I speak not of the birth of this flesh or the present habiliment, which the wise counselor was wearing, but he said, I speak of the birth of the Spirit. Ye must be born again, and theology has said, only born again, and that is error. It is a smoke screen of doubt between man and his God. What happens with man? Why does his path cross the path of others, where he encounters seeming disagreement? He is meeting Caesar with whom he dealt in previous embodiment and mind you well Caesar shall be paid, when Caesar is met. God makes no demand. What shall man of earth do when he encounters a fellow man and say, at least in thought? Not necessarily in words of mouth, he shall say, you are my brother, you are my sister, come up higher. When man's physical travail to end. When through desired consciousness, he completely surrenders in recognition of the indwelling Christ. Heaven is a state of consciousness and cannot be otherwise. And its opposite, call it perdition, call it Gehenna, call it Hades, call it Hell, call it what you will, is likewise a state of consciousness. Man's tenanting a physical body is of his own choice, and not a mandate of God. In your scripture you read of the twelve thrones upon which man shall rule, as he follows the Christ illumination through the regeneration. Likewise, you read of the twelve portals of the twelve gates to the heavenly estate. And in the zodiac you have twelve houses, do you not? And in which house does man start his earthly travail? In the zodiac, we shall reason that Pisces is the first house. And rebirth after rebirth, after rebirth, after rebirth, after rebirth, man passes through one house to another, until he has come back to Pisces. And as he is journeying through the twelve houses of the zodiac, he is ascending through the twelve thrones or centers of the regeneration, and he is passing, if you please, through the twelve portals of twelve gates of heaven. And this is all in consciousness, dear hearts. This is in accordance with divine idea. Your God is merciful God. Yet man in his ignorance shall say, Why has God permitted this to have fallen to my door? Do not blame God. Now, you are justified in asking me this question, Is it necessary for man to pass through the twelve houses or twelve signs of the zodiac for completion of karma? And my answer to you without the slightest hesitation is no it is not. As soon as man recognizes that he is in error, whether the error gives its appearance through the meeting of confusion at the hands, so-called, of some fellow man or otherwise, let him say to himself, there is something wrong here. Likewise was the Galilean provoked to say, come, let us reason together. He was not referring to groups or multitudes of people but he was referring to the reasoning, the divine reasoning of spiritual man with the mortal mind, as the Apostle Paul referred to it or carnal mind. You speak of certain planets in the ascendant. Where are these planets found in truth? Well, they are found in consciousness, each planet with which you are familiar is a state of consciousness. And those which are in the ascendant are the result of rectified errors through previous incarnations. And those which are, would you say, retrograde, or on the counterclockwise of digression, are debts which have not yet been redeemed. We are aware that you are interested in a most interesting spiritual science. You call it astrology. Please define the meaning of the word astro. Student, the astral shell made by man's thinking. And how comes the astral shell or astral body? 
student, in man's thinking. Every though contrary to truth, ever deed is a result of every contrary thought builds this astral body. It is not strange that there is a kindredness of affection between certain men and women of earth. Desire brings it into rebirth. It is not strange that there is a willfulness and an antagonism likewise. Desire brings it through rebirth and so the treadmill of life is endless until man finds truth and it shall never be found in that which man has learned to call church and It can only be found in the higher precepts and principles of Christianity. What is Christianity? It is void of form. It never becomes a fable. It does not give its appearance as a phantom. Christianity is living the Christ principle, the wise man in the manger of consciousness in action and it meets you through every house of the zodiac and through every experience. Hurry and find it, dear hearts. Do not be concerned with that spell's digression. But shut of it. Be clear o f it. Say, I had enough of you. And all that you find in the ascendancy say, you are mine, you have been with me, from the beginning but I could not see you because I was interested in fear, trouble, worry. Planetary signs understood never become cumbersome weights. A writer with whom you are familiar, or rather his writings, said, and it was Sir Francis Bacon who made the statement, all that which is wrong, is wrong as thinking makes it such. And if you are going to hunt for signs and digressions you will find them. Seek, search, find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you ask, and ye shall receive. Dear hearts, listen with me. You have exposed a precious science. It is of the Christ. It is spiritual. It spells unadulterated, uncontaminated, Christianity. And should you find one who is less fortunate than yourself, as you are making a delineation of their life, put your one hand on their shoulder and with the other hand grasp their other hand and say, Come you are my brother, you are my sister. Come up higher, we are one. Remember as true as the statement has been you, are a child of God from the beginning, as man reckons time, millions of years ago. Do not be deceived. Ritual, form, confession of faith, do not make you a child of God. You are God's child from the beginning of time and it shall ever be thus. Bless you, bless you, a thousand times ten thousand. Chapter 18 Spiritual Words of Truth, Unknown Tongues Truly this is as the wedding feet of Canaan, the wedding of the forces, rising from immortal intellect to spiritual intelligence, spiritual substance. In the twelfth chapter of the first book of Corinthians, the first book so called you will find statements relative to the gift of the Spirit. And as you read those statements, you will find that there shall be those given over to speaking in unknown tongues. But the Apostle Paul says, What shall it benefit a man, if they remain uninterpreted? This next statement I make in love, in the fullness of love, and by no means in the least wise in derogatory mention of that which man has engaged in, relative to the speaking of tongues, because of his misinterpretation. What is meant by the speaking in unknown tongues? Are terms of truth recognized to those who do not understand? For you will remember that when the Apostle Paul wrote those statements for the peoples of Corinth, they were stepped in pagan superstition. And the unknown tongues, Paul referred to were the tongues of words of truth. As we look back as it were, upon man of earth, and yet in this very hour, we find him wandering about on the highways or byways seeking, seeking, seeking comfort for mortal distress. It is blessed, blessed indeed that you, dear hearts are joined together in this hour. If these words were to be heard in many of the places where man is now seeking release from the self-inflicted mental torment because of his unknowing, he would reject them. And we speak these words, dear hearts, without condemnation, for we come in love. Who is to be condemned because he does not understand? Moment by moment, hour, by hour, day by day week by week, month after month and year after year, as you have learned to reckon time, man gradually seeks truth and eventually he finds it. Blessed is the supreme idea of the Father, which has established the law of rebirth. While man of earth denies it, because of his ignorance of it, does not mean to say it is untrue. Why are you gathered here this evening? 
It is not out of curiosity. It is not out of idle curiosity, but you, the image and likeness of God, you are beginning to travel back to the Father's house. You are willing to listen to unknown tongues. Unknown to the average individual, but not unknown to you. Why? For the reason that the involution of the soul, cries for the liberty it denied itself, when you are in adherence to, as in theology we used to say, the faith of the fathers. There can be no evolution to the flesh without involution, dear hearts. Now I may digress just a wee bit. Man has been prone to stand before a mirror and say, well, it look pretty good today, or to the contrary he may say, I do not look so good. And that is error. For that which is seen reflected in the mirror, is not man. Here is this room as y'all look at the artificial light, you are seeing one of the myriad expressions of that power. As you walk along the road you will see a tiny flower, a blade of grass, a reed in the marsh, gently moving, touched by the docile breeze. But let that which you have called the wind, gain in velocity and it no longer remains docile, but it becomes what you have learned to call a cyclone, a tornado. It causes the great typhoons and is capable of devastating great areas. Have you seen the power? I dare say not. When man shall see God, he shall see himself and not until then. And when in spiritual enlightenment he meets himself, he shall have met the master, or ancient age. The master. The wise man. The Christ of God, born in the infant body. All birth of flesh is immaculate, dear hearts. It cannot be otherwise, for God is immaculate. That which is conceived in the purity of thought, attracts the ancient soul coming back to claim one of its last physical habiliments, sex, the greatest institution in the creation of the father and the most sordidly abused. Mary, who bore the physical body tenanted by the Christ of God. Immaculate conception? Yes dear hearts, and do not reject it. How came it about? But in this wise, through the blending of the aura, and that man need to learn much about. Why do you feel uncomfortable in the presence of certain individuals? Whether you have so stated or not, I dare say you have heard others make this remark, I felt so uncomfortable when I was in their presence. Then, to the contrary you meet individuals. As you call them who upon first meeting, you can safely say, I love them, I cannot wait until I meet them again. And as you days roll by in the interim of another meeting, your soul yearns for their nearness. What has happened? Well, to he who has traveled through many embodiments, the auric vehicle becomes refined. May I use that word? And when that individual meets one who has not passed through the regeneration of the mortal will, there is a clash and hence no agreement, a disagreement. But when two souls meet, vibrating on the same rate of spiritual frequency, May I say, well, that is quite different. There is an agreement, there is an accord, there is an understanding. You have come in contact with people and you have said to yourself and to others no doubt, I know them but I cannot remember where I have met them, and from then until now you are in a state of wonderment, as it were. Yes, you have met them, you know them. But why the seeming lack of recognition? Well, it is in this wise the recognition is soul recognition, the blending of the auras, the agreement, the accord. The lack of recognition is because you are looking at the physical body, with the physical eye and of course you have never met that soul in that body. Do not be disturbed. Do not become disquieted because you do not immediately recognize, but in the inner recesses of the soul's consciousness will to know. Man must pass through various devious experiences, and you are going through school again. You have passed through the same school many, many times, but through mortal confusion, you have failed to remember. But dear hearts, as you become less desirous of the baser environments of the physical, is proof sufficient that you are reaching that state of growth where the veil shall be rent in twain and you shall remember all things which have ever been. The Apostle Paul put it in these words, When I was a child I spake as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man I put aside or I put away childish things. Now though I see through a glass darkly, then shall I see face to face. This is a very great step for you, dear hearts. 
And though you may be enthralled to a degree, and although you may question, which is your birthright, never accept anything until it becomes reasonable to you in consciousness. But whatever is happening in your thought process at this moment, give it room, do not annihilate it, give it room. For you will remember, when the voice spoke to Mary she pondered the words in her heart. And as you ponder truth in your heart, you are bringing about the Immaculate Conception and you are making way for a new experience. This that you are indulging, in, is not an accident. It has not come about by chance. It is the working out of the immutable law of life. I trust that we have shared with you from the manna of life and the manna shall no longer be hidden, but it shall be before you, ever in readiness for a feast, every moment of every hour of every day. Remember, dear hearts, whatever you enter into to do, let his be your statement of truth, this I do unto the Father. Your hands as you stretch them forth are symbols of giving and as you close them and bring them close to your body, they are symbols of receiving. They carry either a benediction of love or that which is contrary. Dedicate your body to the Father. Have no fear, dear hearts. Learn to say, Use me Father for the purpose for which I am a part of your eternal creation. God is love. His heaven is your heaven. It is within you. You have never been separated from God, you cannot be separated from God, only as you so will to do in your disregard of the presence of God in your thinking. Truly this hour is as the wedding of Canaan. For the bride and groom have met. Intellect rises to intelligence and supreme substance. Infinite being is the priest and witness to this marriage. We bless it. We bless it. We bless it. Go forth in peace. All of the Father's is yours and all that which you are and ever shall be is of the Father. Our blessing rests upon those, who out along the highways and byways of life, are misusing their bodies. Listen, dear hearts, you may become ambassadors of the Father. You may carry the message of truth to those who are less fortunate than yourself. Do not scatter it in a promiscuous manner. But when the knock comes upon the door of your heart, when the Inquisitor stands at your door, open it. For remember, the door to your heart opens on the inside. Open IT. Remember, regardless of how man has desecrated himself in the abuse of his talents, he is your brother. You are the lights of the world. Your eyes have become singled unto the light. Therefore, dear hearts, the light is great, and how dark can the dwelling place of moral man remain, when the light of God is she within it. Let your light shine. Now, one last word, you remember the Nazarene left these words. And I. Listen dear hearts mind this well. And I. If I be lifted up I shall draw all mankind unto me. You are the I am, the Christ of God, incarnate in the flesh. It was the Christ power, the Christ consciousness which spoke though the physical vehicle of he who was known as Jesus of Nazareth. The Christ of God speaks through you regardless of the individual you meet. Learn to say this, I behold you a child of God. The Christ in me greets the Christ in you. This is truth, dear hearts. God is no respecter of persons. You are his child. Your hands express, let them express love. We are grateful to you for your attention. We shall be with you again. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you a thousand times ten thousand. So mote it be. Chapter 19, An Ascension in Consciousness We are happy, inasmuch as you are making discoveries. And the greater the unveiling in consciousness, the sturdier your growth. Though it may appear to you that we speak in mysteries, it is not such. All that is necessary is for you to listen. And true to the statement, silently you ask. Of whom do you ask? Not we of the Council. For in silence you are opening the door to the nearness of the vastness of which you are a part. What happens when you do this? You are experiencing the ascension after crucifixion. What do we mean by the crucifixion? You have, so to speak, crucified the five physical senses of their betrayals. You have not annihilated them, but you have eradicated betrayal. You are no longer a doubter. You are no longer a Judas, a betrayer. 
you are no longer an unregenerate Peter, a denier. The three, moral perceptions, I have just referred to are three of the five physical senses which are most detrimental to man. And after you have crucified their deception into its native nothingness, you arise and begin to shine, as it were, in the fullness of the great white light. All distress of the physical body, as we have previously mentioned, is because of imbalanced chemistry. Chemistry. Is there anything which expresses life where chemistry is not to be found? We are agreed that in all that which expresses life there is to be found a chemical analysis. Although man of earth may not be agreed, we are agreed and as that which you have learned to call time unfolds itself, you too shall be agreed. All life. All life wherever you find it expressed, cannot continue without light and color. For when all color is blended together it expresses its parent, the great white light of the cosmos. When man has risen above or ascended above worry, anger, fear, all that which is contrary to love. Let me repeat, when man has made the ascension and through knowing, through acceptance, declares his oneness with the living God, each throne center, of which there are twelve, becomes radiantly active with the parent light. In a previous lesson we referred to man in quest of spiritual emancipation as being Israelitish. An Israelite is one who seeks release from bondage. You will remember the story of the Israelites as they were captives. They were held in bondage in consciousness. But there was a man called Moses, and Moses led the children from Egypt. What is the meaning of Moses? Emancipator, Deliverer. And there was a parting of a body of water, as the story is told Red Sea. What does the Red Sea symbolize? Why the Red Sea? It symbolizes love. And at what particular season of the year did Moses lead the Israelites? It happened in the spring. Of the year meaning new life, new expression of life, all that which lay dormant during the season you called winter. And there is a portion of spectrum of the sun which man refers to as cool or cold. When man is willfully disobedient to God he is in the winter season of life. He is not experiencing the warmth of love. But when the warmth of the spectrum kisses the earth, the bloom on the apple tree comes forth and because of its obedience to warmth of God love, it becomes the apple. Part of the sun in the apple. We have heard it mentioned that corn grows at night. Why do it express growth at night? Because there is part of the moon in the corn as well as the rose. And what is the moon? The reflected light of the sun, and there would be no reflected light if it were not for the sun. Here is a seeming mystery. To man. The rose like the corn is active because of the reflected light of the sun. It receives its beneficence during the day. But when the intense vibratory action of the sun's rays become less intense, as that which you know as darkness appears after that which you call the setting of the sun has taken place, the corn and the rose express in the quietude, listen dear hearts, in the quietude, what they have absorbed when the sun's rays were very active. Out of the vast comes nearness. When man becomes mentally quiet, peaceful. Call it meditation, call it prayer, call it what you will, when he removes himself from all mental frustration he becomes as the corn, as the rose. A little bit of God's heaven in everything that grows. Man is inclined to become, and I want to be kind in making this statement, he becomes a trifle unmindful of God when everything about him appears to him to be beautiful. He is inclined to rather forget. He is like the mariner of old, when the sun shone bright and the sea was calm, the mariner became vicious with his seamen, blasphemous tyrannical. But, when the sea became tempestuous, enraged, he said to those with whom he had quarreled when the sun shone brightly, Let us pray. Let us ask for a stilling of the waters, and to reach harbor safely. And the voice answered him and said, If you had found me in the calm, you would know me in the storm. The corn, the rose, found God in the calm, of the day. And as the sun reflected its light to the darkness of that which man knows as night, the corn and the rose have no fear. There was no storm, no tempestuous sea. What happens when imbalanced chemistry begins to express itself through the evidence of that which is known as pain, discomfort? That is the tempestuous sea. What happens when man seeks God? How is the sea calmed? How is pain annihilated? 
How does the physical temple become whole? Man, through prayer, desires to know God in greater measure though he has erred, speaks to each fiber, each cell, each particle of the physical temple, and particularly does he speak to the red and pale purple corpuscles. And through quiescence, prayer, meditation, he becomes part of the vastness. He becomes peaceful. And though he is aware of it or not, he is saying to the corpuscular structure of the blood, Agree with thine adversary while thou art yet in the way with him. Become harmonious, ye laborers in the field of the master, ye laborers. In the vineyard of the master. Work together in harmony. It has not been too long since we have said to you, Harmony is born from the womb of love. Listen, dear hearts, wherever you see the expression of adversity as you walk along life's path, pause long enough in your thinking to say, Father I thank you that that which I behold about me has not come nigh my dwelling. It has been truly written and truly mentioned, man's extremity becomes God's opportunity, and it has not been too long since we have spoke to you, dear hearts, of full surrender in love. Out of the vast comes nearness all one, dear hearts, that is nearness. Not alone. All one. For the God of love of which man sings, has put a little bit of his heaven into every living thing. And, a you ministered you became vibrant, alive, living, full, whole from the storehouse of the great vastness of infinite, supply. Another poet having read those beautiful lines of love, expressed it in this manner. Would you know life abundant, love doubled for all you give? There is a means no surer than helping someone to live. Good night, bless you, bless you, bless you. Chapter 20, Worshipping False Gods Life is a quiet stream of water. All is well. Do not look upon, nor accept the reflected confusion of he who has not the place wherein to put his trust. There is an hour which comes to he who is unconcerned with the true pattern of life. Moment by moment, hour by hour, man becomes closer to the realization of his kindredness to God. There are seasons when man is prone to wander from the path, some call it carelessness, others call it disobedience. It comes about though the creation of a false image. It is true that there is nothing impossible with God. One of the ancients has said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And man has been led to believe that taking the name of the Lord in vain is but desecrating God's name through speech. Likewise it is written, Thou shalt have not other God before me. Taking the name of God in vain is speaking in terms of limitation, thinking in terms of limitation, living in a mental atmosphere of limitation, all that which is contrary to truth and justice between man and his neighbor. All manner of covetousness is a part of false gods. It is truth profound that man attracts unto himself that which he desires. Worshipping false gods is placing error before truth, hence the statement. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? As we have attempted to reason before, man has no soul, he is soul. Therefore, to lose his soul is to lose himself. The man or woman who chooses to follow a certain desired pattern in life, should be content to go forth in the field of their labor and garner that which has been sown, but that does not happen. In the hour of desperation such a one cries, O oh God help me. And it is wise, when man finds the fruits of that which he has sown disquieting, that he becomes mindful to say, God deliver me. There are some however, who, with a sense of false mental stability, here in the hour of darkness, continue to worship their false gods. And when the mixture becomes separated, the falling away of the mortal coil from the soul, they pass on into what man has learned to call eternity, self-willed, still denying the creative principle of life. Such a one does not return as readily as one who has accepted, and in the interim between that what man has learned to call death and rebirth, they continue to disregard and will not accept the lessons of the masters. What manner of path can such a one choose upon their return to the earth plane? Only that which they have created man cannot disregard the law of attraction. You are wondering at this very moment, why we speak in this manner. Well, there are those myriad in number who are waiting to return and we of the council labor with them zealously. But you may say to me, if they will not understand, why continue to labor? 
through they do not accept, freely accept, yet there is a picture which they behold that cannot be disregarded. And by the very law which they have established, which shall bring them back into a path of like attraction, the picture which has been created will reveal itself at certain intervals, after they have started their trek along the physical plane of life. Man cannot truthfully say that he lives in ignorance of truth. Man cannot say that. For each time he is prone to misbehavior, a picture of truth is revealed to him. And from memory's scroll he reads the records of the masters of the spheres and he says, I should not do this. It is wrong. If you were to ask him how he knows it is wrong, he perchance would be unable to tell you. Yet the truth becomes indelibly imprinted. Thus we can be perfectly agreed that no man walks in total darkness. There is light regardless of its seemingly feeble flame. Some call it conscience. That is a very good name. Others refer to it as the small voice from within, and that is expressing it most perfectly. The voice of the masters of the spheres speak. Truly it is the still small voice from within. Memory. The voice of memory. Man cannot excuse himself from his error. He has, as you of earth would say, no legitimate excuse. Man lives deliberately so. And in truth he cannot deny it. Each step along life's path is deliberately taken. For remember, when man say in his thinking, this is wrong but I shall do it anyway. That is. Deliberate, is it not? Therefore, let man be honest with himself. Before leaving you, may I share with you these last words, will to live justly, uprightly. Continue to declare, I will to live according to the perfect pattern. In so doing there is no room for error. I cannot enter. Regardless of what you hear, do not become frustrated or overwrought with undue anxiety. Constantly affirm, I will to live in accord with life's perfect pattern. In so doing, it shall never become necessary for you to say, I trust I shall be fairly dealt with. There is never any reason for man to deny error if man does not recognize it. Therefore continue to say, the perfect pattern, the perfect will, is now manifesting itself in my life in all of my affairs. See perfection, think perfection, live it with every breath you take. Should there come to your attention unkind statements, do not even take time to say that they are untrue. Continue to repeat. The perfect will, the perfect pattern governs my life and all of my affairs, and in so doing you become no part whatsoever of adversity. You are listening to the still small voice of the great angelic hosts of the spheres. Each night, particularly when you are lying your physical body down for its needed rest, as sleep overtakes your mortal form, drift out over the peaceful ether waves with this thought in mind, all peace is mine, I share love with everything there is in life. Do not say to me, can I truthfully say this? Do not make that statement. Yes, you can truthfully make that statement. You can make it, mean it. Live it. Each one of you can. And in the morning, as you return to your physical temple to raise it from its couch of rest, stand erect, lift your head high, stretch forth your arms and say, All of God's perfect kingdom is mine. All of love is mine. All who love are mine, for I know nothing but love. And let that be your thought throughout the day. And in so doing, in due season, as the blacksmith turns the piece of molten steel in the particular pattern he so desires to shape it, you shall have placed in order your house, your temple, your affairs. You shall have melted, as it were, hearts of stone. What else shall you accomplish? Well, it is blessed, for your thoughts of love shall blend with our thoughts of love. And to those in need, you shall be tearing down for them some of the phantom gods they worshipped when they were in the flesh. Truly, 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 the statement is profitable, overcome. Evil with good. Let your light shine, each one of you, let your light shine. Let your last pleading thoughts be of love. Let your awakening thoughts be of love. Let your thoughts during your conscious hours be of love. And when sleep has overtaken your physical body and you are traveling across the ether waves of eternal life, you shall meet with no other force or power than love. Good night.